Hello and welcome to this complete Kubernetes course. The course is a mix of animated theoretic explanations, but also hands-on demos for you to follow along. So let's quickly go through the topics I'll cover in this course. The first part gives you a great introduction to Kubernetes. We'll start with the basic concepts of what Kubernetes actually is, what problems it solves and the Kubernetes architecture. You will learn how you can use Kubernetes by showcasing all the main components. After learning the main concepts, we will learn and install Minikube for a local Kubernetes cluster. And we will go through the main commands of creating, debugging and deleting pods using kubectl, which is Kubernetes command line tool. After knowing kubectl main commands, I will explain Kubernetes YAML configuration files, which we will use to create and configure components. Then we will go through a practical use case where we'll deploy a simple application setup in Kubernetes cluster locally to get your first hands-on experience with Kubernetes and feel more confident about the tool. In the second part, we will go into more advanced and important concepts like organizing your components using namespaces, how to make your app available from outside using Kubernetes ingress, and learn about Helm, which is the package manager for Kubernetes. In addition, we will look at three components in more detail. First, how to persist data in Kubernetes using volumes. Second, how to deploy stateful applications like databases using stateful set component. And lastly, we will look at the different Kubernetes service types for different use cases. If you like the course, be sure to subscribe to my channel for more videos like this, and also check out the video description for more related courses on Udemy, etc. If you guys have any questions during the course or after the course, or you want to simply stay in touch, I would love to connect with you on social media. So be sure to follow me there as well. So in this video, I'm going to explain what Kubernetes is. We're going to start off with the definition to see what official definition is and what it does. Uh, then we're going to look at the problem solution uh, case study of Kubernetes, basically why did Kubernetes even come around and what problems does it solve? So let's jump in right into the definition. What is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration framework. Uh, which was originally developed by Google. So on the foundation, it manages containers, be it Docker containers or from some other technology, which basically means that Kubernetes helps you manage applications that are made up of hundreds or maybe thousands of containers, and it helps you manage them in different environments, like physical machines, virtual machines, or cloud environments, or even hybrid deployment environments. So what problems does Kubernetes solve and what are the tasks of a container orchestration tool actually? So to go through this chronologically, the rise of microservices caused increased usage of container technologies because the containers actually offer the perfect host for small independent applications like microservices. And the rise of containers and the microservice technology actually resulted in applications that are now comprised of hundreds or sometimes maybe even thousands of containers. Now, managing those loads of containers across multiple environments using scripts and self-made tools can be really complex and sometimes even impossible. So that specific scenario actually caused the need for having container orchestration technologies. So what those orchestration tools like Kubernetes do is actually guarantee following features. One is high availability. In simple words, high availability means that the application has no downtime. So it's always accessible by the users. A second one is scalability, which means that application has a high performance. Um, it loads fast and the users have a very high response rate from the application. And the third one is disaster recovery, which basically means that if an infrastructure has some problems like uh, data is lost or the servers explode or something bad happens with the server center, uh, 
the infrastructure has to have some kind of mechanism to back up the data and to restore it to the latest state so that application doesn't actually lose any data. And the containerized application can run from the latest state after the recovery. And all of these are functionalities that container orchestration technologies like Kubernetes offer. So in this video, I want to give you an overview of the most basic fundamental components of Kubernetes, uh, but just enough to actually get you started using Kubernetes in practice, either as a DevOps engineer or a software developer. Now, Kubernetes has tons of components, but most of the time you're going to be working with just a handful of them. So I'm going to build a case of a simple JavaScript application with a simple database, and I'm going to show you step by step how each component of Kubernetes actually helps you to deploy your application and what is the role of each of those components. So let's start with the basic setup of a, a worker node or in Kubernetes terms, a node, which is a simple server, a physical or virtual machine. And the basic component or the smallest unit of Kubernetes is a pod. So what pod is, is basically an abstraction over a container. So if you're familiar with Docker containers or container images, so basically what pod does is it creates this running environment or a layer on top of the container. And the reason is because Kubernetes wants to abstract away the container runtime or container technologies so that you can replace them if you want to. And also because you don't have to directly uh, work with Docker or whatever container technology uh, you use in a Kubernetes. So you only interact with a Kubernetes layer. So we have an application pod, which is our own application, and that will maybe use a database pod with its own container. And this is also an important concept here. Pod is usually meant to run one application container inside of it. You can run multiple containers inside one pod, but usually it's only the case if you have one main application container and a helper container or some side service that has to run inside of that pod. And as you see, this is nothing special. You just have one server and two containers running on it with a abstraction layer on top of it. So now let's see how they communicate with each other in Kubernetes world. So Kubernetes offers out of the box a virtual network, which means that each pod gets its own IP address not the container, the pod gets the IP address and each pod can communicate with each other using that IP address, which is an internal IP address. Obviously it's not the uh, public one. So my application container can communicate with database using the IP address. However, pod components in Kubernetes, also an important concept are ephemeral, which means that they can die very easily. And when that happens, for example, if I lose a database container because the container crashed because the application crashed inside or because the node, the server that I'm running them on uh, ran out of resources, the pod will die and a new one will get created in its place. And when that happens, it will get assigned a new IP address which obviously is inconvenient if you are communicating with the database using the IP address because now you have to adjust it every time a pod restarts. And because of that, another component of Kubernetes called service is used. So service is basically a static IP address or permanent IP address that can be attached, so to say, to each pod. So my app will have its own service and database pod will have its own service. And the good thing here is that the life cycles of service and the pod are not connected. So even if the pod dies, the service and its IP address will stay. So you don't have to change that endpoint anymore. So now obviously you would want your application to be accessible through a browser, right? And for this, you would have to create an external service. So external service is a service that opens the communication from external sources. But obviously you wouldn't want your database to be open to the public requests. And for that, you would create something called an internal service. So this is 
a type of a service that you specify when creating one. However, if you notice the URL of the external service is not very practical. So basically what you have is uh, an HTTP protocol with a node IP address. So of the node, not the service and the port number of the service, which is good for test purposes if you want to test something very fast but not for the end product. So usually you would want your URL to look like this if you want to talk to your application with a secure protocol and a domain name. And for that, there is another component of Kubernetes called ingress. So instead of service, the request goes first to ingress and it does the forwarding then to the service. So now we saw some of the very basic components of Kubernetes. Um, and as you see, this is a very simple setup. We just have a one server um, and a couple of containers running and some services. Nothing really special where Kubernetes advantages or the actual cool features really uh, come forward, but we're going to get there step by step. So let's continue. So as we said, Pods communicate with each other using a service. So my application will have a database endpoint, let's say called MongoDB service that it uses to communicate with the database. But where do you configure usually this database URL or endpoint? Usually you would do it in application um, properties file or as some kind of external environmental variable, but usually it's inside of the built image of the application. So for example, if the endpoint of the service or service name in this case changed to MongoDB, you would have to adjust that URL in the application. So usually you'd have to rebuild the application with a new version and you have to push it to the repository. And now you'll have to pull that new image in your pod and restart the whole thing. So a little bit tedious for a small change like database URL. So for that purpose, Kubernetes has a component called config map. So what it does is it's basically your external configuration to your application. So config map would usually contain configuration data like URLs of a database or some other services that you use. And in Kubernetes, you just connect it to the pod so that pod actually gets the data that config map contains. And now if you change the name of the service, the endpoint of the service, you just adjust the config map and that's it. You don't have to build a new image. You don't have to go through this whole cycle. Now, part of the external configuration can also be database username and password, right? Which may also change in the application deployment process, but putting a password or other credentials in a config map in a plain text format would be insecure, even though it's an external configuration. So for this purpose, Kubernetes has another component called secret. So secret is just like config map, but the difference is that it's used to store secret data credentials, for example, and it's stored not in a plain text format, of course, but in base 64 encoded format. So secret would contain things like credentials. And of course, I mean, database user, you could also put in config map, but what's important is the passwords, certificates, things that you don't want other people to have access to would go in the secret. And just like config map, you just connect it to your pod so that pod can actually see those data and read from the secret. You can actually use the data from config map or secret inside of your application pod using, for example, environmental variables or even as a properties file. So now to review, we've actually looked at almost all mostly used Kubernetes basic components. We've looked at the pod. We've seen how services are used, what is ingress component useful for, and we've also seen external configuration using config map and secrets. So now let's see another very important concept generally, which is data storage and how it works in Kubernetes. So we have this database pod that our application uses and it has some data or it generates some data. With this setup that you see now, if the database container or the pod gets restarted, the data would be gone. 
And that's problematic and inconvenient, obviously, because you want your database data or log data to be persisted reliably long term. And the way you can do it in Kubernetes is using another component of Kubernetes called volumes. And how it works is that it basically attaches a physical storage on a hard drive to your pod. And that storage could be either on a local machine, meaning on the same server node where the pod is running, or it could be on a remote storage, meaning outside of the Kubernetes cluster. It could be a cloud storage, or it could be your own premise storage, which is not part of the Kubernetes cluster. So you just have an external reference on it. So now when the database pod or container gets restarted, all the data will be there, persisted. It's important to understand the distinction between the Kubernetes cluster and all of its components and the storage. Regardless of whether it's a local or remote storage, think of a storage as an external hard drive plugged in into the Kubernetes cluster. Because the point is Kubernetes cluster explicitly doesn't manage any data persistence, which means that you as a Kubernetes user or an administrator are responsible for backing up the data, replicating and managing it and making sure that it's kept on a proper hardware, etc because it's not taking care of Kubernetes. So now let's see everything is running perfectly and a user can access our application through a browser. Now with this setup, what happens if my application pod dies, right? Crashes or I have to restart the pod because I built a new uh, container image. Basically, I would have a downtime where a user can reach my application which is obviously a very bad thing if it happens in production. And this is exactly the advantage of distributed systems and containers. So instead of relying on just one application pod and one database pod, etc., we are replicating everything on multiple servers. So we would have another node where a replica or clone of our application would run, which will also be connected to the service. So remember previously we said the service is like an persistent static IP address with a DNS name so that you don't have to constantly adjust the endpoint when a pod dies. But service is also a load balancer, which means that the service will actually catch the request and forward it to whichever pod is least busy. So it has both of these functionalities. But in order to create the, the second replica of the my application pod, you wouldn't create a second pod, but instead you would define a blueprint for a my application pod and specify how many replicas of that pod you would like to run. And that component or that blueprint is called deployment, which is another component of Kubernetes. And in practice, you would not be working with pods or you would not be creating pods. You would be creating deployments because there you can specify how many replicas and you can also scale up or scale down the number of replicas of pods that you need. So with pod, we said that pod is a layer of abstraction on top of containers and deployment is another abstraction on top of pods, which makes it more convenient to interact with the pods, replicate them and do some other configuration. So in practice, you would mostly work with deployments and not with pods. So now if one of the replicas of your application pod would die, the service will forward the requests to another one. So your application would still be accessible for the user. So now you're probably wondering what about the database pod? Because if the database pod died, your application also wouldn't be accessible. So we need a database replica as well. However, we can't replicate database using a deployment. And the reason for that is because database has a state, which is its data. Meaning that if we have clones or replicas of the database, they would all need to access the same shared data storage. And there you would need some kind of mechanism that manages which pods are currently writing to that storage or which pods are reading from that storage in order to avoid data inconsistencies. And that mechanism 
in addition to replicating feature, is offered by another Kubernetes component called stateful set. So this component is meant specifically for applications like databases. So MySQL, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, or any other stateful applications or databases should be created using stateful sets and not deployments. It's a very important distinction. And stateful set, just like deployment, would take care of replicating the pods and scaling them up or scaling them down, but making sure that database reads and writes are synchronized so that no database inconsistencies are offered. However, I must mention here that deploying database applications using stateful set in Kubernetes cluster can be somewhat tedious. So it's definitely more difficult than working with deployments where you don't have all these challenges. That's why it's also a common practice to host database uh, applications outside of the Kubernetes cluster and just have the deployments or stateless applications that replicate and scale with no problem inside of the Kubernetes cluster and communicate with the external database. So now that we have two replicas of my application pod and two replicas of the database and they're both load balanced, our setup is more robust, which means that now even if node one, the whole node server was actually rebooted or crashed and nothing could run on it, we would still have a second node with application and database pods running on it and the application would still be accessible by the user until these two replicas get recreated. So you can avoid downtime. So to summarize, we have looked at the most used Kubernetes components. We start with the pods and the services in order to communicate between the pods and the ingress component, which is used to route traffic into the cluster. We've also looked at external configuration using config maps and secrets and data persistence using volumes. And finally, We've looked at pod blueprints with replicating mechanisms like deployments and stateful sets, where stateful set is used specifically for stateful applications like databases. And yes, there are a lot more components that Kubernetes offers, but these are really the core, the basic ones. Just using these core components, you can actually build pretty powerful Kubernetes clusters. In this video, we're going to talk about basic architecture of Kubernetes. So we're going to look at two types of nodes that Kubernetes operates on. One is master and another one is slave. And we're going to see what is the difference between those and which role each one of them has inside of the cluster. And we're going to go through the basic concepts of how Kubernetes does what it does and how the cluster is self-managed and self-healing and automated and how you as a operator of the Kubernetes cluster um, should end up having much less manual effort. And we're going to start with this basic setup of one node with two application pods running on it. So one of the main components of a Kubernetes architecture are its worker servers or nodes. And each node will have multiple application pods with containers running on that node. And the way Kubernetes does it is using three processes that must be installed on every node that are used to schedule and manage those pods. So nodes are the cluster servers that actually do the work. That's why sometimes also called worker nodes. So the first process that needs to run on every node is the container runtime. In my example, I have Docker, but it could be some other technology as well. So because application pods have containers running inside, a container runtime needs to be installed on every node. But the process that actually schedules uh, those, con those pods and the containers then underneath is kubelet which is a process of Kubernetes itself, unlike container runtime, that has interface with both container runtime and the machine, the node itself. Because at the end of the day, Kubelet is responsible for taking that configuration and actually running a pod or starting a pod with a container inside and then assigning resources from that node to the container. 
like CPU, RAM and storage resources. So usually Kubernetes cluster is made up of multiple nodes, which also must have container runtime and kubelet services installed. And you can have hundreds of those worker nodes, which will run other pods and containers and replicas of the existing pods, like my app and database pods in this example. And the way that communication between them works is using services, which is sort of a load balancer that basically catches the request directed to the pod or the application, like database, for example, and then forwards it to the respective pod. And the third process that is responsible for forwarding requests from services to pods is actually kube proxy that also must be installed on every node. And kube proxy has actually intelligent forwarding logic inside that makes sure that the communication also works in a performant way with low overhead. For example, if an application my app replica is making a request to the database, instead of service just randomly forwarding the request to any replica, it will actually forward it to the replica that is running on the same node as the pod that initiated the request. Thus, this way avoiding the network overhead of sending the request to another machine. So to summarize, two Kubernetes processes, kubelet and kube proxy must be installed on every Kubernetes worker node along with an independent container runtime in order for a Kubernetes cluster to function properly. But now the question is, how do you interact with this cluster? Or do you decide on which node a new application pod or database pod should be scheduled? Or if a replica pod dies, what process actually monitors it and then reschedules it or restarts it again? Or when we add another server, how does it join the cluster to become another node and get pods and other components created on it? And the answer is all of these managing processes are done by master nodes. So master servers or master nodes have completely different processes running inside. And these are four processes that run on every master node that control the cluster state and the worker nodes as well. So the first service is API server. So when you as a user want to deploy a new application, in a Kubernetes cluster, you interact with the API server using some client. It could be a UI like Kubernetes dashboard, could be a command line tool like kubelet or a Kubernetes API. So API server is like a cluster gateway, which gets the initial requests of any updates into the cluster or even the queries from the cluster. And it also acts as a gatekeeper for authentication to make sure that only authenticated and authorized requests get through to the cluster. That means whenever you want to schedule new pods, deploy new applications, create a new service or any other components, you have to talk to the API server on the master node and the API server then validate your request. And if everything is fine, then it will forward your request to other processes um, in order to schedule the pod or create this component that you requested. And also if you want to query the status of your deployment or the cluster health, etc., you make a request to the API server and it gives you the response, which is good for security because you just have one entry point into the cluster. Another master process is a scheduler. So as I mentioned, if you send an API server a request to schedule a new pod, API server, after it validates your request, will actually hand it over to the scheduler in order to start that application pod on one of the worker nodes. And of course, instead of just randomly assigning it to any node, scheduler has this whole intelligent way of deciding on which specific worker node the next pod will be scheduled or next component will be scheduled. So first it will look at your request and see how much resources the application that you want to schedule will need, how much CPU, how much RAM. And then it, it's going to look at, and it's going to go through the worker nodes and see the available resources on each one of them. And if it sees that one node is the least busy or has the most resources available, it will schedule 
the new pod on that node. An important point here is that scheduler just decides on which node a new pod will be scheduled. The process that actually does the scheduling, that actually starts that pod with a container is the kubelet. So it gets the request from the scheduler and executes the request on that node. The next component is controller manager, which is another crucial component because what happens when pods die on any node, there must be a way to detect that the nodes died and then reschedule those pods as soon as possible. So what controller manager does is detect state changes like crashing of pods, for example. So when pods die, controller manager detects that and tries to recover the cluster state as soon as possible. And for that, it makes a request to the scheduler to reschedule those dead pods. And the same cycle happens here where the scheduler decides based on the resource calculation, which worker nodes should restart those pods again and makes requests to the corresponding kubelets on those worker nodes to actually restart the pods. And finally, the last master process is etcd, which is a key value store of a cluster state. You can think of it as a cluster brain, actually, which means that every change in the cluster, for example, when a new pod gets scheduled, when a pod dies, all of these changes get saved or updated into this key value store of etcd. And the reason why etcd store is a cluster brain is because all of this mechanism with scheduler, controller manager, etc., works because of its data. So for example, how does scheduler know what resources are available on, on each worker node? Or how does controller manager know that a cluster state changed in some way? For example, pods died or that kubelet restarted new pods upon the request of a scheduler. Or when you make a query request to API server about the cluster health, or for example, your application deployment state, where does API server get all this state information from? So all of this information is stored in etcd cluster. What is not stored in the etcd key value store is the actual application data. For example, if you have a database application running inside of a cluster, the data will be stored somewhere else, not in the etcd. This is just a cluster state information which is used for master processes to communicate with the work processes and vice versa. So now you probably already see that master processes are absolutely crucial for the cluster operation, especially the etcd store, which contains some data must be reliably stored or replicated. So in practice, Kubernetes cluster is usually made up of multiple masters, where each master node runs its master processes, where of course the API server is load balanced and the etcd store forms a distributed storage across all the master nodes. So now that we saw what processes run on worker nodes and master nodes, Let's actually have a look at, at a realistic example of a cluster setup. So in a very small cluster, you would probably have two master nodes and three worker nodes. Also to note here, the hardware resources of master and node servers actually differ. The master processes are more important, but, but they actually have less load of work. So they need less resources like CPU, RAM and storage whereas the worker nodes do the actual job of running those pods with containers inside. Therefore, they need more resources. And as your application complexity and its demand of resources increases, you may actually add more master and node servers to your cluster and thus forming a more powerful and robust cluster to meet your application resource requirements. So in an existing Kubernetes cluster, you can actually add new master or node servers pretty easily. So if you want to add a master server, you just get a new bare server, you install all the master processes on it and add it to the Kubernetes cluster. Same way, if you need two worker nodes, you get bare servers, you install all the worker node processes, like container runtime, kubelet and kubeproxy on it, and add it to the Kubernetes cluster. That's it. And this way you can infinitely increase 
the power and resources of your Kubernetes cluster as your replication complexity and its resource demand increases. So in this video, I'm going to show you what Minikube and kubectl are and how to set them up. So first of all, let's see what is Minikube. Usually in the Kubernetes world, uh, when you're setting up a production cluster, it will look something like this. So you would have multiple masters, uh, at least two in a production setting, and you would have multiple worker nodes. And master nodes and the worker nodes have their own separate responsibility. So as you see on the diagram, you would have actual separate virtual or physical machines that each represent a node. Now, if you want to test something on your local environment, or if you want to try something out very quickly, for example, deploying new application or new components, um, and you want to test it on your local machine, obviously setting up a cluster like this will be pretty difficult or maybe even impossible if you don't have enough resources like memory and CPU, etc. And exactly for the use case, there is this open source tool that is called a Minikube. So what a Minikube is, is basically one node cluster where the master processes and the worker processes both run on one node. And this node will have a Docker container runtime pre-installed. So you will be able to run the containers or, or the pods with containers on this node. And the way it's going to run on your laptop is through a virtual box or some other hypervisor. So basically, Minikube will create a virtual box on your laptop and the node that you see here, or this node, will run in that virtual box. So to summarize, Minikube is a one node Kubernetes cluster that runs in a virtual box on your laptop, which you can use for testing Kubernetes on your local setup. So now that you've set up a cluster, or a mini cluster on your laptop or PC on your local machine, you need some way to interact with a cluster. So you want to create components, configure it, etc. And that's where kubectl comes in the picture. So now that you have this virtual node on your local machine that represents Minikube, you need some way to interact with that cluster. So you need a way to create pods and other Kubernetes components on the node. And the way to do it is using kubectl, which is a command line tool for Kubernetes cluster. So let's see how it actually works. Remember we said that Minikube runs both master and worker processes. So one of the master processes called API server is actually the main entry point into the Kubernetes cluster. So if you wanna do anything in the Kubernetes, if you wanna configure anything, create any component, you first have to talk to the API server. And the way to talk to the API server is through different clients. So you can have a UI, like a dashboard, you can talk to it using Kubernetes API or a command line tool, which is kubectl. And kubectl is actually the most powerful of all the three clients, because with kubectl, you can basically do anything in the Kubernetes that you want. And throughout this video tutorials, we're going to be using kubectl mostly. So once the kubectl submits commands to the API server to create components, delete components, etc., the worker processes on Minikube node will actually make it happen. So they will be actually executing the commands to create the pods, to destroy the pods, to create services, etc. So this is the Minikube setup. And this is how kubectl is used to interact with the cluster. An important thing to note here is that kubectl isn't just for Minikube cluster. If you have a cloud cluster or a hybrid cluster, whatever, kubectl is the tool to use to interact with any type of Kubernetes cluster setup. So that's important to note here. So now that we know what Minikube and kubectl are, let's actually install them to see them in practice. I'm using Mac, so the installation process will probably be easier, but I'm gonna put the links to the installation guides in the description, so you can actually follow them to install it on your operating system. Just one thing to note here is that Minikube needs a virtualization, because as we mentioned, it's gonna run in a virtual box setup or some hypervisor, um, so you will need to install some type of hypervisor. It could be VirtualBox. I'm going to install a HyperKit, but it's going to be in those step-by-step -step instructions as well. So I'm going to show you how to install it on a Mac. 
So I have a macOS Mojave, so I'm going to show you how to install Minikube on this macOS version. And I'm going to be using Brew to install it. So Brew update. And the first thing is that I'm going to install um, a hypervisor hyperkit. So I'm going to go with the hyperkit. Go ahead and install it. I already had it installed it, so with you, if you're doing it for the first time, it might take uh, longer because it has to download all these dependencies and stuff. And now I'm going to install Minikube. And here's the thing, Minikube has kubectl as a dependency. So when I execute this, it's going to install kubectl as well. So I don't need to install it separately. So let's see here. Installing dependencies for Minikube, which is um, Kubernetes CLI. This is kubectl. Again, because I already had it installed before, it still has a local copy of the dependencies. That's why it's uh, pretty fast. Um, it might take longer if you're doing it for the first time. So now that everything is installed, let's actually check the commands. So kubectl command should be working. So I get this list of the commands with kubectl. So it's uh, there and minikube should be working as well. And as you see, minikube comes with this command line tool, which is pretty simple. So with one command, it's going to bring up the whole Kubernetes cluster in this one node setup and that you can do stuff with it and you can just stop it or delete it. It's pretty easy. So now that we have both installed and the commands are there, let's actually create a minikube Kubernetes cluster. And as you see, there is a start command. Let's actually clear this. So this is how we're going to start a Kubernetes cluster, cube, minikube start. And here is where the hypervisor installed comes in. Because since minikube needs to run in a virtual environment, we're going to tell minikube which hypervisor um, it should use to start a cluster. So for that, we're going to specify an option, which is VM driver. And here I'm going to set the hyperkit that I installed. So I'm telling Minikube, please use hyperkit um, hypervisor to start this virtual Minikube cluster. So when I execute this, it's going to download some stuff. So again, it may take a little bit longer if you're doing it for the first time. And as I mentioned, Minikube has Docker runtime or Docker daemon pre-installed. So even if you don't have Docker on your machine, it's still going to work. So you would be able to create containers inside because it already contains Docker, which is a pretty good thing uh, if you don't have Docker already installed. So done, kubectl is now configured to use Minikube, which means the Minikube cluster is set up and kubectl command, which is meant to interact with the Kubernetes clusters, is also connected with that Minikube cluster, which means if I do kubectl get notes, which just gets me a, a status of the notes of the Kubernetes cluster, it's going to tell me that the Minikube node is ready. And as you see, it's, it's the only node and it has a master role because it obviously has to run the master processes. Um, and I can also get the status with Minikube executing Minikube status. So I see host is running kubelet, which is a service that actually runs the pods using container runtime is running. So basically everything is running. And by the way, if you want to see Kubernetes uh, architecture in more detail and to understand how master and worker nodes actually work and what all these processes are, um, I have a separate video that covers Kubernetes architecture. So you can check it out on this link. And we can also check which version of Kubernetes we have installed. And usually it's going to be the latest version. So with kubectl version, you actually know what the client version of Kubernetes is and what the server version of Kubernetes is. And here we see we're using 1.17. And that's the Kubernetes version that is running in the Minikube cluster. So if you see both client version and server version in the output, it means that Minikube is correctly 
installed. So from this point on, we're going to be interacting with the Minikube cluster using kubectl command line tool. So Minikube is basically just for the startup and for deleting the cluster, but everything else configuring, we're going to be doing through kubectl. And all these commands that I executed here, I'm going to put them in a list in the comment section so you can actually copy them. In this video, I'm going to show you some basic kubectl commands and how to create and debug pods in Minikube. So now we have a Minikube cluster and kubectl installed. And once the cluster is set up, you're going to be using kubectl to basically do anything in the cluster, to create components, uh, to get the status, etc. So first thing, we are going to just get the status of the nodes. So we see that there is one node, which is a master, and everything's going to run on that node because it's a mini cube. Um, so with kubectl get, I can check the pods and I don't have any. That's why no resources. I can check the services, kubectl get services. And I just have one default service and so on. So with this kubectl get, I can list any Kubernetes components. So now, since we don't have any pods, we're going to create one. And to create Kubernetes components, there is uh, a kubectl create command. So if I do help on that kubectl uh, create command, I can see available commands for it. So I can create all these components using kubectl create, but there is no pod on the list because in Kubernetes world, the way it works is that the pod is the smallest unit of the Kubernetes cluster. But usually in practice, you're not creating pods or you're not working with the pods directly. There is an abstraction layer over the pods that is called deployment. So this is what we are going to be creating and that's going to create the pods underneath. And this is a usage of kubectl create deployment. So I need to give a name of the deployment and then provide some options. And the option that is required is the image because the pod needs to be created based on certain, some image or some container image. So let's actually go ahead and create Nginx deployment. So kubectl create deployment. We, let's call it Nginx deployment um, image equals Nginx. It's just gonna go ahead and download the latest Nginx image from Docker Hub. That's how it's gonna work. So when I execute this, you see deployment Nginx deeple created. So now if I do kubectl get deployment, you see that I have one deployment created. I have a status here, which says it's not ready yet. So if I do kubectl get pod, you see that now I have a pod which has a prefix of the deployment and some random hash here. And it says container creating. So it's not ready yet. So if I do it again, it's running. And the way it works here is that when I create a deployment, deployment has all the information or the blueprint for creating the pod. The, for the, this is the minimalistic or the most basic configuration for a deployment. We're just saying the name and the image. That's it. The rest is just defaults. And between deployment and a the pod, there is another layer, which is automatically managed by Kubernetes deployment called replica set. So if I do kubectl get replica set written together, you see I have an nginx dipple replica set um, hash and it just gives me a state. And if you notice here, the pod name has a prefix of deployment and the replica sets ID and then its own ID. So this is how the pod name is made up. And the replica set basically is managing the replicas of a pod. You in practice will never have to create replica set or delete a replica set or update in any way. You're going to be working with deployments directly, which is more convenient because in deployment, you can configure the pod blueprint 
completely. You can say how many replicas of the pod you want and you can do the rest of the configuration there. Here with this command, we just created one pod or one replica. But if you wanted to have two replicas of the Nginx pod, we can just provide as additional options. So this is how the layers work. First, you have the deployment. The deployment manages a replica set. A replica set manages all the replicas of that pod. And the pod is, again, an abstraction of a container. And everything below the deployment should be managed automatically by Kubernetes. You shouldn't have to worry about any of it. For example, the image that it uses, I will have to edit that in the deployment directly and not in the pod. So let's go ahead and do that right away. So I'm going to do kubectl edit deployment. And I'm going to provide the name, Ginex. And we get an auto-generated configuration file of the deployment. Because in the command line, we just gave two options. Everything else is default and auto-generated by Kubernetes. Um, and you don't have to understand this now, but I'm going to make a separate video where I break down the configuration file and the syntax of the configuration file. For now, let's just go ahead and scroll to the image, which is somewhere down below. And let's say I wanted to fixate the version to 1.16 and save that change. And as you see, deployment was edited. And now when I do kubectl get pod, I see that the old pod, so this one here is terminating and another one started 25 seconds ago. So if I do it again, the old pod is gone and the new one got created with the new image. And if I do, if I get replica set, I see that the old one has no pods in it and a new one has been created as well. So we just edited the deployment configuration and everything else below that got automatically updated. And that's the magic of Kubernetes and that's how it works. Another very practical command is kubectl logs, which basically shows you what the application running inside the pod actually logged. So if I do kubectl logs and I will need the pod name for this, um, I will get nothing because Nginx didn't log anything. So let's actually create another deployment uh, from MongoDB. So let's call it Mongo deployment and the image and the image will be Mongo. So let's see. Kubectl. So now I have the MongoDB deployment creating. So let's go ahead and log that. This status here means that the pod was created, but the container inside the pod isn't running yet. And when I try to lock, obviously it tells me there is no container running, so it can show me any locks. So let's get the status again. At this point, if I'm seeing that container isn't starting, I can actually get some additional information by kubectl describe pod and the pod name which here shows me what state changes happened inside the pod. So it pulled the image, created the container and started container. So kubectl get pod, it should be running already. So now let's log it, kubectl logs. And here we see the log output. So it took a little bit, but this is what the MongoDB application container actually logged inside the pod. And obviously, if a container has some problems, it's going to help with debugging to see what the application is actually printing. So let's clear that and get the pods again. So another very useful command when debugging, when something is not working or you just want to check what's going on inside the pod is kubectl exec. So basically what it does is that it gets the terminal of that MongoDB 
application container. So if I do kubectl exec interactive terminal, that's what IT stands for. I will need the pod name dash dash. So, so with this command, I get the terminal of the MongoDB application container. And as you see here, I am inside the container of MongoDB as a root user. So I'm in a completely different setting now. And as I said, this is useful in debugging or when you want to test something or try something, you can enter the container or get the terminal and execute some comments um, inside there. So we can exit that again. And of course with kubectl, I can delete the pods. So if I do get deployment, I misspelled that. So kubectl deployment, I see that I have two of them. And if I do kubectl get pod and replica set, I have also two of them. So let's say if I wanted to get rid of all the pods, replica sets underneath, I will have to delete the deployment. So delete deployment, and I'll have to provide the name of the deployment. I'm gonna uh, delete, let's delete MongoDB, delete it. And now if I'm gonna say kubectl get pod, the pod should be terminating. And if I do get replica set, the MongoDB replica set is gone as well. And the same if I do delete deployment, Nginx depot and do the replica set, see everything gone. So all the CRUD operations, create, delete, update, etc., happens on the deployment level and everything underneath just follows automatically. And the similar way, way we can create other Kubernetes resources like services, etc. However, as you notice, when we are creating uh, Kubernetes components like deployment using kubectl create deployment, um, and I misspelled it all the time, you'll have to provide all these options on the command line. So you'll have to say the name and you'll have to specify the image and then you have this option one, option two, uh, etc. And there could be a lot of things that you want to configure in a deployment or in a pod. And obviously it will be impractical to write that all out on a command line. So because of that, in practice, you would usually work with Kubernetes configuration files, meaning what component you're creating, what the name of the component is, what image is it based off, and any other options. They're all gathered in a configuration file and you just tell kubectl to execute that configuration file. And the way you do it is using kubectl apply command. And apply basically takes the file, the configuration file as a parameter and does whatever you have written there. So apply takes an option called minus F that stands for file. And here you would say the name of the file. So this will be the config file dot YAML. This is the format that you're usually going to use for configuration files. And this is the command that executes whatever is in that configuration file. So let's actually call it configuration file, um, I don't know, nginx deployment. And let's go ahead and create a very simplistic, super basic uh, nginx deployment file. So here I'm gonna create that file. So this is the basic configuration for the deployment. So here I'm just specifying what I want to create. I want to create a deployment, the name of the deployment. You can ignore these labels uh, right now. Uh, how many replicas of the pods I want to create. And this plug right here, the template and specification is a blueprint for the pods. So specification for the deployment and specification for a pod. And here we're just saying that we want one container inside of the pod with nginx image, and we are gonna bind that on port 80. So this is gonna be our configuration file. And once we have that, we can apply that configuration. So 
So deployment created. So now if I get pod, I see that Nginx deployment pod was created and it's running. And let's also see the deployment was created 52 seconds ago. And now if I wanted to change something in that deployment, I can actually change my local configuration. For example, I wanted two replicas instead of one. I can apply that again. Deployment, Nginx deployment configured. And as you see, the difference here is that Kubernetes can detect if the Nginx deployment doesn't exist yet, it's going to create one. But if it already exists and I apply the configuration file again, it's going to know that it should update it instead of creating a new one. So if I do get deployment, I see this is the old one or the old deployment. And if I do kubectl get pod, I see the old one is still there and a new one got created because I increased the replica count, which means that with kubectl apply, you can both create and update uh, a component. And obviously you can do kubectl with services, volumes, any other com Kubernetes components, just like we did it with the deployment. So in the next video, I'm going to break down the syntax of the configuration file, which is pretty logical and simple actually to understand. And I'm going to explain all the different attributes and what they mean. So you can write your own configuration files for different components. So to summarize, we've looked at a couple of kubectl commands in this video. We saw how to create a component like deployment, how to edit it and delete it. We saw how to get status of pods, deployments, replica sets, etc. We also logged on the console, whatever application is writing it to the console in the pod. And we saw how to get a terminal of a running container using kubectl exec. And finally, we saw how to use a Kubernetes configuration file to create and update components using the kubectl apply command. And last but not least, we saw kubectl describe command useful when a container isn't starting in a pod and you want to get some additional troubleshooting information about the pod. In this video, I'm going to show you the syntax and the contents of Kubernetes configuration file, which is the main tool for creating and configuring components in Kubernetes cluster. If you've seen large configuration files, it might seem overwhelming, but in reality, it's pretty simple and intuitive and also very logically structured. So let's go through it step by step. So here I have examples of a deployment and service configuration files side by side. So the first thing is that every configuration file in Kubernetes has three parts. The first part is where the metadata of that component that you're creating uh, resides. Um, and one of the metadata is obviously name of the component itself. The second part in the configuration file is specification. So each component's configuration file will have a specification where you basically put every kind of configuration that you want to apply for that um, component. Um, the first two lines here, as you see, is just declaring what you want to create. Here we are creating deployment and here we're creating a service. And this is basically that you have to look up for each component. There's a different API version. So now inside of the specification part, obviously the attributes will be specific to the kind of a component that you're creating. So deployment will have its own attributes that only apply for deployment and the service will have its own stuff. But I said there are three parts of a configuration file and we just see metadata and the specification. So where's the third part? So the third part will be a status, but it's going to be automatically generated and edited by Kubernetes. So the way it works is that Kubernetes will always compare what is the desired state and what is the actual state or the status of that component. And if the status and desired state do not match, then Kubernetes knows there's something to be fixed there. So it's going to try to fix it. 
And this is the basis of the self-healing feature that Kubernetes provides. For example, here you specify you want two replicas of Nginx deployment. So when you apply this, when you actually create the deployment using this configuration file, that's what apply means, Kubernetes will add here the status of your deployment and it will update that state continuously. So for example, if a status at some point will say just one replica is running, then Kubernetes will compare that status with the specification and we'll know there is a problem there. Another replica needs to be created SAP. Now, another interesting question here is, where does Kubernetes actually get that status data to automatically add here or update continuously? That information comes from the ITCD. Remember the cluster brain, one of the master processes that actually stores the cluster data. So ITCD holds at any time the current status of any Kubernetes component. And that's where the status information comes from. So as you see, the format of the configuration files is YAML. That's why the extension here. And generally it's pretty straightforward to understand. It's a very simple format, but YAML is very strict about the indentations. So for example, if you have something wrongly indented here, your file will be invalid. Um, so what I do, especially if I have a configuration file that has 200 lines, it's pretty long. Um, I usually use some YAML online validator to see where I need to fix that. Um, but other than that, it's pretty simple. Um, another thing is where do you actually store those um, configuration files? A usual practice is to store them with your code because since the deployment and service is going to be applied to your application, it's a good practice to store these configuration files in your application code. So usually it will be part of the whole infrastructure as a code concept. Or you can also have its own Git repository just for the configuration files. So in the previous video, I showed you that deployments manage the pods that are below them. So whenever you edit something in a deployment, it kind of cascades down, down to all the pods that it manages. And whenever you want to create some pods, you would actually create a deployment and it will take care of the rest. So how does this happen or where is this whole thing defined in the configuration? Um, so here in the specification part of a deployment, you see a template. And if I expand it, you see the template also has its own metadata and specification. So it's basically a configuration file inside of a configuration file. And the reason for it is that this configuration applies to a pod. So pod should have its own configuration inside of the deployments configuration file. And that's how all the deployments will be defined. And this is going to be the blueprint for a pod, like which image it should be based on, which port it should open, um, what is going to be the name of the container, etc. So the way the connection is established is using labels and selectors. So as you see, metadata part contains the labels and the specification part contains selectors. It's pretty simple. In a metadata, you give a component like deployment or pod a key value pair. And it could be any key value pair that you think of. In this case, we have app nginx and that label just sticks to that component so we give pods created using this blueprint label app nginx and we tell the deployment to connect or to match all the labels with app nginx to create that connection so this way deployment will know which pods belong to it now deployment has its own label, app nginx, and these two labels are used by the service selector. So in the specification of a service, we define a selector, which basically makes a connection between the service and the deployment or its pods, because service must know 
which pods are kind of registered with it. So which pods belong to that service. And that connection is made through the selector of the label. And we're going to see that in a demo. So another thing that must be configured in the service and pod is the ports. So if I expand this, I see that service has its ports configuration and the container inside of a pod is obviously running or needs to run at some port, right? So how this is configured is basically service has a port where the service itself is um, accessible at. So if other service sends a request to Nginx service here, it needs to send it on port 80, but the service needs to know to which pod it should forward the request, but also at which port is that pod listening. And that is the target port. So this one should match the container port. And with that, we have our deployment and service basic configurations done. And to note here, most of these attributes that you see here in both parts are required. So this will actually be the minimum configuration for deployment and service. So once we have those files, let's actually apply them or create components uh, using them. So let's head over to the console. And here I'm going to create both deployment and service. So kubectl apply nginx deployment created and nginx service. So now if I get the pods, I see two replicas are running because that's how we defined it here. And we have our service as well, which is nginx service. This is a default service. It's always there. Um, this is the one we created and it's listening on port 80 as we specified. Now, how can we validate that the service um, has the right pods that it forwards the um, request to? We can do it using kubectl describe service and the service name. And here you see the endpoints where you have all this status information here, like the things that we define in the configuration, like app selector, uh, etc. We have the target port that we define and we have the endpoints here. And this must be the IP addresses and ports of the pods that the service must forward the request to. So how do we know that these are the IP addresses of the right pods? Because with kubectl get pod, you don't get this information. So the way we do it or way we find that out is using get pod and then you do dash O, which is for output. And then we want more information. So O wide. And here we see more columns here. So we have the name and status ready, etc. But we also have the IP address. So here is the IP address endpoint specified here. And this is the other one. So we know that the service has right endpoints. So now let's see uh, the third part of the configuration file, which is a status that Kubernetes automatically generated. And the way to do it is we can get the deployment nginx deployment in a YAML format. So when I execute this command, I will get the resulting or the updated configuration of my deployment, which actually resides in the etcd, because etcd stores the status of um, the whole cluster, including every component. So um, if I do this, I'll get the YAML output in my console, but I want it in the file. So I'm going to save it into um, nginx deployment result and I'm going to save it there and I'm going to open it in my editor next to the original one. So as you see, a lot of stuff has been added, but let's just see the status part. So all of this is automatically added and updated constantly by Kubernetes. 
So it says how many replicas are running, what the state of those replicas and some other information. So this part can also be helpful when debugging. So there's the status, but also if you noticed other stuff has been added in the metadata and specification part as well. So for example, uh, creation timestamp, when was the component created is automatically added by Kubernetes because it is a metadata, some unique ID, etc. You don't have to care about it. And in the specification part, it just adds some defaults um, for that component. But again, you don't have to care or understand most of these attributes. But one thing to note here is that if you, for example, want to copy um, a deployment that you already have using um, maybe automated scripts, you will have to remove and get rid of uh, most of this generated stuff. So you have to clean that deployment configuration file first, um, and then you can create another deployment from that blueprint uh, configuration. So that's it with this video. So from now on, we're going to be working with the configuration files. So for example, if I want to delete the deployment and the service, I can do it using that file um, configuration file as well using delete and like this, the deployment will be gone and I can do the same for service. So using kubectl apply and kubectl delete, you can basically work with the configuration files. In this video, we're going to deploy two applications, MongoDB and Mongo Express. And I chose these two because it demonstrates really well a typical simple setup of a web application and its database. So you can apply this to any similar setup you have. So let's see how we're going to do this. So first we will create a MongoDB pod. And in order to talk to that pod, we are going to need a service and we're going to create an internal service, which basically means that no external requests are allowed to the pod. Only components inside the same cluster can talk to it. And that's what we want. Then we're going to create a Mongo express deployment. One, we're going to need a database URL of MongoDB so that Mongo express can connect to it. And the second one is credentials. So username and password of the database so that it can authenticate. So the way we can pass this information to Mongo Express deployment is through its deployment configuration file through environmental variables, because that's how the application is configured. So we're going to create a config map that contains database URL, and we're going to create a secret that contains the credentials. And we're going to reference both inside of that deployment file. So once we have that set up, we're going to need Mongo Express to be accessible through a browser. In order to do that, we're going to create an external service that will allow external requests to talk to the pod. So the URL will be HTTP IP address of the node and the service uh, port. So with this setup, the request flow will now look like this. So the request comes from the browser and it goes to the external service of the Mongo Express, which will then forward it to the Mongo Express pod. The pod will then connect to internal service of MongoDB. That's basically the database URL here. And it will forward it then to MongoDB pod, where it will authenticate the request using the credentials. So now let's go and create this whole setup using Kubernetes configuration files. Let's dive right into it and create the whole setup. So first of all, I have a mini cube cluster running. If I do kubectl get all, which basically gets me all the components that are inside the cluster, I only have a default Kubernetes service. So my cluster is empty and I'm starting from scratch. So the first thing that I said we're going to do is create a MongoDB deployment. Um, I usually create it in an editor. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code and um, paste a prepared deployment file there for MongoDB. And this is how it's going to look like. So I have a uh, deployment kind and I have some metadata. I'm just going to call it MongoDB deployment. Um, labels and selectors. Uh, in the previous video, I already explained the syntax of uh, Kubernetes YAML 
comp configuration file. So if you want to know what all these attributes mean, then you can check out that video. And here in the template, I have a definition or blueprint for pods that this deployment gonna create. And I'm just gonna go with one replica. So the container is gonna be called MongoDB and this is the image that I'm gonna take. So let's actually go and check out the image configuration for MongoDB. So Mongo and I see this image here. Let's open this. And basically what I'm looking for is how to use that um, container, uh, meaning what ports it's gonna open and what uh, external configuration it's gonna take. So a default port of MongoDB container is 27,017. So I'm gonna use that. And we are gonna use um, variables, environmental variables, the root username and root password. So basically I can, uh, on the container startup, define the admin username and password. So let's go ahead and configure all of that inside the configuration file. So here below the image of MongoDB, so we're just gonna leave the name of the image and it's gonna pull the latest one and that's what we want. So here I'm gonna specify what port I want to expose. So ports, that's the attribute name and container port. And that's the standard port, so I'm gonna leave it. And below that, I'm gonna specify those two environmental variables. So one is called, let's see what it's called. It's Mongo init db root username. And here is gonna be a value. So we're gonna actually leave it blank for now. And the other one is called init root password. And we're gonna leave that blank as well, just value. And once we have the values here, um, we're gonna have a complete deployment for MongoDB. This is basically all we need. Now, note that this is a configuration file that is gonna be checked into a repository. So usually you wouldn't write admin username and password inside the configuration file. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create a secret from where we will reference the values. So meaning that the secret is gonna be live in Kubernetes and nobody will have access to it in a Git repository. So we're gonna save this incomplete um, deployment file, first of all. So let's call it uh, Mongo deployment, or let's just call it Mongo YAML and save it here so that we get the syntax highlight. And now before we apply this configuration, we're gonna create the secret where the root username and password will leave. So let's create a new uh, file and I'm gonna paste in the configuration of a secret, which is actually pretty simple. So we have a kind secret, then we have a metadata, which again is just simply the name. Uh, we're gonna call it MongoDB secret. The type opaque is actually a default type, which is the most basic key value secret type. Other types, for example, include uh, TLS certificates, so you can create a secret specifically with a TLS certificate type and a couple of more types but mostly you're gonna use the default one and these are the actual contents. So you have the data and here you have key value pairs, um, which of course are the names you come up with. So we're gonna specify username or we can actually call it um, Mongo root username and we're gonna call it Mongo root password. And here's the thing, the values in in these key value pairs are not plain text. So when we are creating a secret, the value must be base64 encoded. So the way you can do that, the simplest way is go to your terminal. So here I'm gonna say echo minus n, very important option, don't leave it out. Otherwise it's not gonna work. And here I'm gonna put a plain text value that I want. So I'm just gonna go with just username, whatever, of course, you can have something more secretive here. And I'm gonna base64 encode it. And the value that I get here, I'm gonna copy it into 
the secret configuration as a value. And I'm going to do the same with password. So again, I'm just going to go with simple password. Obviously, you want to have something more secure. And I'm going to copy that as a value here and save it as mongo secret.yaml. OK. Now, we have only written configuration files. We haven't created anything yet in the cluster. So this is just preparation work. And we have to create secret before the deployment if we're going to reference the secret inside of this. So the order of creation matters. Because if I'm creating a deployment that references a secret that doesn't exist yet, I'm going to get an error. So it's not going to start. Since we have our first component, let's actually go ahead and create our secret from a configuration file. So again, I'm going to go to my um, console. Let's actually clear all this. And I'm going to go into the folder where I'm creating all these configuration files. I called it Kubernetes configuration. And here I have both of my files. So I'm, I'm going to do kubectl apply mongo secret and secret created. So I'm going to do kubectl get secret and I should see my secret has been created. This is something created by default with a different type and this is our secret here. So now that we have our secrets, we can reference it inside of our deployment configuration file. So let's go back and this is how you reference contents specific key value data of secret. So instead of value, we're going to say value from. And then I'm going to do secret key ref or secret key reference. And name is going to be the secret name. So this one here. And key is going to be the key in the data. I want the value of this key value pair. So I want this part of the data. So I'm going to reference it by key. So you don't have to learn it by heart. Obviously, all the syntax and attribute names. Important thing here is that you know approximately how to reference it. The actual syntax you can always look up in Google or maybe from previous configuration files. But yeah, this is how you reference it. And we're going to do the same with password. So I'm going to do from and I'm just going to copy the rest here. Remember, YAML is very strict with the indentation. Here is the same secret, but a different key. So I'm going to use password key here. And that will be it. So now we have the root username and password referenced from the secret and no actual values inside the configuration file, which is good for security because you don't want your credentials in your code repository. OK, so our deployment file is actually ready. So let's apply that. kubectl apply. And the deployment created, meaning if I do get all, I should see the pod starting up, the deployment, and the replica set. So let's actually check how pod is doing. Container creating. So let's actually watch. It might take some time to create it. If it takes long, and if you want to see whether there is a problem there, you can also do kubectl describe pod and the pod name. So at least we know nothing's wrong there. So we see that it's just pulling the image. So that's what it takes so long. So let's see again, kubectl get pod. And as you see, it's running. So we have MongoDB deployment and the pod, one replica of its pod running. Now the second step is we're going to create an internal service so that other components or other pods can talk to this MongoDB. So let's go ahead and create service configuration. So go back to um, YAML. And here we can either create a separate YAML configuration file for secret, or we can also include it in the same one. So in YAML, you can actually put multiple documents in one file. So if I put three dashes, 
uh, that's basically a syntax for document separation in YAML. So a new, new document is starting. So actually I'm gonna put both deployment and service in one configuration file because they usually belong together. So here I'm gonna paste the service configuration. And by the way, I'm gonna put all these configuration files in Git repository and link the uh, repository in the description of this video. So this is a service for MongoDB. Let's go through uh, some of the attributes here. So it's the service kind, just the name. We're gonna call it MongoDB service. Selector, this is an important one because we want this service to connect to the pod, right? And the way to do that is using selector and label. So using this here, the labels that deployment and pod have, service can find the pods that it's gonna attach to. Right, so we have the selector here, and this is an important part where we expose service port. So this is gonna be the service port, and this is gonna be the container. And since we expose container port at this address right here, these two have to match. So target port is container or pod port, and this is the service port. And obviously these two here can be different, but I'm gonna go with the same port, and that's basically it. That's our service. So I'm gonna create the service now. So let's save this file and go back to my console. And I'm gonna apply the same file that I applied before to create deployment. So let's see what happens. See both deployment and service configuration, but it's gonna know that I haven't changed the deployment. That's what it means here. And a service is created. So if I were to edit both, for example, I can reapply the file and deployment and service can be changed. So I think using local configuration files is a handy way to edit your components. So now let's actually check that our service was created. Get service. And this is our service. And it's listening at port 27017. And I showed it in one of the previous videos, but we can actually also validate that the service is attached to the correct pod. And to do that, I'm gonna do describe, describe service, and I need the service name for this. So here I have the endpoint, which is an IP address of a pod and the port where the application inside the pod is listening it. So let's actually check that this is the right pod. I mean, we just have one, but still. So if I do get pod, and I want additional output to what I get by default, one of the columns includes the IP address, which is this one right here. So 172.17. 06. That's the pod IP address. And this is the port where the application inside the pod is listening at. So everything is set up perfectly. MongoDB deployment and service has been created. And by the way, if you want to see all the components for one um, application, you can also display them using kubectl get all. That will show all the components and you can filter them by name. So MongoDB. And here you see the service, deployment, replica set, and the pod. So when you do all, the component type will be uh, the first here. Okay, that's uh, just a side info. So now the next step, we're gonna create Mongo Express deployment and service, and also an external configuration um, where we're gonna put the database URL for MongoDB. So let's go ahead and do it. So I'm gonna clear that up and go and create a new file for Mongo Express deployment and service. So this is the deployment draft of Mongo Express. Same things here, Mongo Express, that's the name. Um, and here we have the pod definition where the image name is Mongo Express. Let's actually go ahead and check that image as well. We don't need this, this is Mongo Express. And that's the name of the image, Mongo Express. And let's see the same data here. Let's see the port, the Mongo Express application 
inside the container starts at is 8081. And these are some of the environmental variables. So obviously we need three things for Mongo Express. We need to tell it which database application it should connect to. So obviously we need to tell it the MongoDB address, database address it should connect to the internal service. And we, we're going to need credentials so that MongoDB can authenticate that connection. And the environmental variables to do that is going to be admin username, admin password, and the MongoDB endpoint will be this here. So these three environmental variables we need. So let's go ahead and use that. So first we're going to open the port. Again, container ports. And the reason why you have multiple ports is that inside of the pod, you can actually open multiple ports. So that's going to be 8081. And now we're going to add the environmental variables for the connectivity. So the first one is the username. And this is going to be obviously the same username and password that we defined right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy them because it's really the same. So the value from we're going to read it from the secret that's already there. So I'm going to paste it here. Second environmental variable is called admin password. And I'm also going to copy that from here. And the third one is going to be the database server. And since this is also an external configuration, we could either do value here and we could write the MongoDB server address directly here. Or as I showed you in the diagram at the beginning, we can put it in a config map, which is an external configuration so that it's centralized. So it's stored in one place and also other components can also use it. So for example, if I have two applications that are using MongoDB database, then I can just reference that external configuration here. And if I have to change it at some point, I just change it in one place and nothing else gets updated. So because of that, we're going to keep this incomplete uh, deployment configuration and we're going to create the config map, which will contain the MongoDB server uh, address. So I'm going to create a new file. Let's actually save this incomplete deployment. Let's call it Mongo Express YAML and we're going to come back to it later. So save that. Now we need a config map here. So I'm going to copy the configuration. And this is also pretty simple, just like secret. You have the kind, which is config map, the name and the same construct. See, just like you saw here data, which is key value pair, it doesn't have a type because they're just one config map type and that's it. And here you again have uh, key value pairs. So database URL and server name is actually the name of the service. It's as simple as that. So what did we call our service? We called it MongoDB service. So I'm going to copy the service name and that's going to be the database server URL. So I'm going to copy that and let's actually call it Mongo uh, config map for consistency and save it. And just like with secret, the order of execution or creation matters. So I have to have a config map already in the cluster so that I can reference it. So when we're done, I have to con create the config map first and then the deployment. So the way that I can reference the config map inside the deployment is very similar to secret. So I'm actually going to copy the whole thing from secret, put it here. The only thing different here is that instead of secret, I'm going to say config map. It's all camel case. And obviously the name is going to be config map. That's what we called it, I think. Yes, that's the name. Let's actually copy it. And again, the key is the key in the key value pair here. So let's copy that as well. So now I have our Mongo Express deployment. These are just standard stuff. And this is where the pod blueprint or container configuration exists. We have exposed port 8081. This is the image with the latest tag. 
And these are the three environmental variables that Mongo Express needs to connect and authenticate with MongoDB. So deployment is done and let's go ahead and create config map first and then Mongo Express deployment. Qctl apply config map and I'm gonna do Qctl apply Mongo Express and let's see the pod. So container creating, looks good. So let's see the pod and it's running. And I actually want to see the logs. So I'm going to lock the Mongo Express. And here you see that Express server started and database connected. So now the final step is to access Mongo Express from a browser. And in order to do that, we are going to need an external service for Mongo Express. So let's go ahead and create that one as well. So let's clear this output, go back to visual code. And as we did last time in the same file as the deployment, I'm going to create Mongo Express service because actually in practice, you never have deployment without the service. So it makes sense to uh, keep them together. And this is Mongo Express external service. And this configuration right now looks exactly same as the MongoDB service configuration. And even the ports are the same. Like here, I have exposed service port at 8081 and target port is where the container uh, port is listening. So how do I make this external service is by doing two things. So in the specification section, so I'm going to do it below the selector, I'm going to put a type and a type of this external service is load balancer. Which I think is a bad name for external service because internal service also acts as a load balancer. So if I had two MongoDB pods, the internal service would also load balance the request coming to these pods. So I think the load balancer type name was chosen not very uh, well because it could be confusing. But what this type load balancer does basically is it accepts external requests by assigning the service an external IP address. So another thing that we're going to do here to make this service external is right here, we're going to provide third port. And this is going to be called node port. And what this is basically is the port where this external IP address will be open. So this will be the port that I'll have to put in the browser to access this service. And this node port actually has a range and that range is between 30,000 and 32,000 something. So I can not give it the same port as here. As I said, it has to be between that range. So I'm just going to go with the 30,000. That's the minimum in that range. And that would be it. So this configuration here will create an external service. Let's go ahead and do it. And I will show you exactly how these ports differ from each other. So I'm going to apply express. So service created. And if I do get service, I see that MongoDB service that we created previously has a type of cluster IP. And the Mongo Express service that we just created is load balancer, which is the type that we specifically defined. An internal service, we didn't specify any type because cluster IP, which is the same as an internal service type, is default. So you don't have to define it when you're creating internal service. And the difference here is that cluster IP will give the service an internal IP address, which is this one right here. So this is an internal IP address of the service and load balancer will also give service an internal IP address. But in addition to that, it will also give the service an external IP address where the external requests will be coming from. And here it says pending because we're in Minikube and it 
works a little bit differently. In a regular Kubernetes setup, here you would also see an actual IP address, a public one. And this is another difference because with internal IP address, you just have port for that IP address. With both internal and external IP addresses, you have ports for both of them. And that's why we had to define third port, which was for the external IP address. As I said, pending means that it doesn't have the external IP address yet. So in Minikube, the way to do that is using the command Minikube service. And I'm going to need the name of the service. So this command will basically assign an external service a public IP address. So I'm going to execute this and the browser window will open and I will see my Mongo Express page. So if I go back to the command line, you see that this command here assigned Mongo Express service a URL with a public IP address or with an external IP address um, and the port, which is what we defined in the node port. So I can basically copy that command, which is the same as this one here. And I get the page for Mongo Express. So now with this setup, the way it's going to work is that when I make changes here, for example, I'm going to create a new database. Let's call it test DB, whatever. And I'm going to create a request. What just happened in background is that this request landed with the external service of Mongo Express, which then forwarded it to the Mongo Express pod. And the Mongo Express pod connected to the MongoDB service, an internal service, and MongoDB service then forwarded that request finally to the MongoDB pod. And then all the way back, and we have the changes here. So that's how you deploy a simple application setup in a Kubernetes cluster. In this video, we're going to go through the usages of a namespace and the best practices of when and how to use a namespace. First of all, what is a namespace in Kubernetes? In Kubernetes cluster, you can organize resources in namespaces. So you can have multiple namespaces in a cluster. You can think of a namespace as a virtual cluster inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Now, when you create a cluster, by default, Kubernetes gives you namespaces out of the box. So in the command line, if I type kubectl get namespaces, I see the list of those out of the box namespaces that Kubernetes offers. And let's go through them one by one. The Kubernetes dashboard namespace is shipped automatically in Minikube. So it's specific to Minikube installation. You will not have this in a standard cluster. The first one is kubesystem. Kubesystem namespace is not meant for your use. So basically you shouldn't create anything or shouldn't modify anything in kubesystem namespace. The components that are deployed in the namespace are the system processes. Uh, they're from master managing processes or kubectl, etc. The next one is kubepublic. And what kubepublic contains is basically the publicly accessible data. It has a config map that contains cluster information, which is accessible even without authentication. So if I type here kubectl cluster info, this is the output that I get through that um, information. And the third one is kube node lease, which is actually a recent addition to Kubernetes. And the purpose of that namespace is that it holds information about the heartbeats of nodes. So each node basically gets its own object that contains the information about that node's availability. And the fourth namespace is the default namespace. And default namespace is the one that you're going to be using to create the resources at the beginning if you haven't created a new namespace. But of course, you can add and create new namespaces. And the way that you can do it is using kubectl create namespace command with the name of the namespace. So I can create my namespace. And if I do kubectl get namespaces, I see that in my list now. Another way to create namespaces is using a namespace configuration file, which I think is a better way to create namespaces because you also have a history um, in your configuration file repository of what resources you created in the cluster. Okay, so now we saw what namespaces are and 
um, that you can create new ones and that Kubernetes offers some of them by default. But the question is, what is the need for namespaces? When should you create them and how you should use them? And the first use case of using or creating your own namespaces is the following. Imagine you have only default namespace, which is provided by Kubernetes, and you create all your resources in that default namespace. If you have a complex application that has multiple deployments, which create replicas of many pods, and you have resources like services and config maps, etc., very soon your default namespace is going to be filled with different components. And it will be really difficult to have an overview of what's in there, especially if you have multiple users creating stuff inside. So a better way to use namespaces in this case is to group resources into namespaces. So for example, you can have a database namespace where you deploy your database and all its required resources. And you can have a monitoring namespace where you deploy the Prometheus and all the stuff that it needs. You can also have elastic stack namespace where all the elastic search kibana etc resources go and you can have nginx ingress resources so just one way of logically grouping your resources inside of the cluster now according to the official documentation of kubernetes you shouldn't use namespaces if you have smaller projects and up to 10 users I personally think that it's always a good idea to group your resources in namespaces because, as I said, even if you have a small project and 10 users, you might still need some additional resources for your application, like, you know, logging system and monitoring system. And even with a minimum setup, you can already get too much to just throw everything in a default namespace. Another use case where you will need to use namespaces if you have multiple teams. So imagine the scenario, you have two teams that use the same cluster. And one team deploys uh, an application which is called My App Deployment. That's the name of the deployment they create. And that deployment has its certain configuration. Now, if another team had a deployment that accidentally had the same name, but a different configuration and they created the deployment or they applied it, they would overwrite the first team's deployment. And if they're using, for example, a Jenkins or some automated way to deploy those, um, that application or to create the deployment, they wouldn't even know that they overwrote or disrupted another team's deployment. So to avoid such kind of conflicts, again, you can use namespaces so that each team can work in their own namespace without disrupting the other. Another use case for using namespaces is, let's say you have one cluster and you want to host both staging and development environment in the same cluster. And the reason for that is that, for example, if you're using something like Nginx controller or Elasticstack, used for logging, for example, you can deploy it in one cluster and use it for both environments. In that way, you don't have to deploy these common resources twice in two different clusters. So now the staging can use both resources as well as the development environment. Another use case for using namespaces is when you use blue-green deployment for your application, which means that in the same cluster, you want to have two different versions of production. So the one that is active, that is in production now, and another one that is going to be the next production version. The versions of the applications in those blue and green production namespaces will be different. However, the same as we saw before in staging and development, these namespaces might need to use the same resources, like again, Nginx controller or Elastic Stack. And this way, again, they can both use this common shared resources without having to set up a separate cluster. So one more use case for using namespaces is to limit the resources and access to namespaces when you're working with multiple teams. So again, we have a scenario where we have two teams working in the same cluster and each one of them has their own namespace. So what you can do in this scenario is that you can give the teams access to only their namespace. So they can only be able to 
create updates, delete resources in their own namespace, but they can't do anything in the other namespaces. In this way, you even restrict or even minimize the risk of one team accidentally interfering with another team's work. So each one has their own secured, isolated environment. Additional thing that you can do on a namespace level is limit the resources that each namespace consumes. Because if you have a cluster with limited resources, you want to give each team a share of resources for their application. So if one team, let's say, consumes too much resources, then other teams will eventually have much less and their applications may not schedule because the cluster will run out of the resources. So what you can do is that per namespace, you can define resource quotas that limit how much CPU, RAM, storage resources one namespace can use. So I hope walking through these scenarios helped you analyze in which use cases and how you should use namespaces in your specific project. There are several characteristics that you should consider before deciding how to group and how to use namespaces. The first one is that you can't access most of the resources from another namespace. So for example, if you have a configuration map in project A namespace that references the database service, you can't use that config map in project B namespace, but instead you will have to create the same config map that also references the database service. So each namespace will define or must define its own config map, even if it's the same reference. And the same applies to secret. So for example, if you have credentials of a shared service, you will have to create that secret in each namespace where you are going to need that. However, a resource that you can share across namespaces is a service. And that's what we saw in the previous slide. So config map in project B namespace references service that is going to be used eventually in a pod. And the way it works is that in a config map definition, the database URL, in addition to its name, which is MySQL service, will have a namespace at the end. So using that URL, you can actually access services from other namespaces, which is a very practical thing. And this is how you can actually use shared resources like Elasticsearch or Nginx from other namespaces. And one more characteristic is that we saw that most of the components resources can be created uh, within a namespace, but there are some components in Kubernetes that are not namespaced, so to say. Um, so basically they live just globally in the cluster and you can't isolate them or put them in a certain namespace. And examples of such resources are volume or persistent volume and node. So basically when you create the volume, it's gonna be accessible throughout the whole cluster uh, because it's not in a namespace. And you can actually list components. They're not bound to a namespace using a command kubectl api resources dash dash namespaced false. And the same way you can also list all the resources that are bound to a namespace using namespace true. So now that you've learned what the namespaces are, why to use them, in which cases it makes sense to use them in which way, and also some characteristics that you should consider, um, let's actually see how to create components in a namespace. In the last example, we've created components using configuration files and nowhere there we have defined a namespace. So what happens is by default, if you don't provide a namespace to a component, it creates them in a default namespace. So if I apply this config map component, and let's do that actually right now. So kubectl apply minus F config map. If I apply that and I do kubectl get config map, my config map was created in a default namespace. And notice that even in the kubectl get config map command, I didn't use a namespace because kubectl get or kubectl commands, they take the default namespace as a default. So kubectl get config map is actually same as kubectl get config map dash n or namespace and default namespace. So these are the same commands. It's just a shortcut because it takes default as a default namespace. Okay, so one way that I can create this config map in a specific namespace is using kubectl apply command, but adding flag namespace and the namespace name. So this will create config map in my namespace. 
And this is one way to do it. Another way is inside the configuration file itself. So I can adjust this config map configuration file to include the information about the destination namespace itself. So in the metadata, I can add a namespace attribute. So if I apply this configuration file again using kubectl apply, and now if I want to get the component that I created in this specific namespace, then I have to add the option or the flag to kubectl get command because as I said, by default, it will check only in the default namespace. So I recommend using the namespace attribute in a configuration file instead of providing it to the kubectl command, uh, because one, it's, it's better documented. So you know, by just looking at the configuration file, where the component is getting created, because that could be an important information. And second, if you're using automated deployment where you're just applying the configuration files, then again, this will be a more convenient way to do it. Now, if for example, we take a scenario where one team gets their own namespace and they has to uh, work entirely in the namespace, it could be pretty annoying to have to add this namespace tag to every kubectl command. So in order to make it more convenient, there is a way to change this default or active namespace, which is default namespace to whatever namespace you choose. And Kubernetes or kubectl doesn't have any out of the box solution for that, but there's a tool called kubeNS or kubens, and you have to install the tool. So on Mac, so I'm gonna execute brew install kubectx. So this will install Cubans tool as well. So once I have the Cubans installed, I can just execute Cubans command. And this will give me a list of all the namespaces and highlight the one that is active, which is default right now. And if I want to change the active namespace, I can do Cubans my namespace. And this will switch the active namespace. So if I do cube ends now, I see that active one is my namespace. So now I can execute kubectl commands without providing my namespace namespace. But obviously, if you switch a lot between the namespaces, this will not be so much um, convenient. For your own operating system and environment, there will be a different installation process. So I'm going to link the kubectx installation guide in the description below. So in this video, we're going to talk about what ingress is and how you should use it. And also what are different use cases for ingress. So first of all, let's imagine a simple Kubernetes cluster where we have a pod of my application and it's corresponding service, uh, my app service. So the first thing you need for a UI application is to be accessible uh, through browser, right? So for external requests to be able to uh, reach your application. So one way to do that, um, an easy way is through an external service where basically you can access the application using HTTP protocol, the IP address of the node and the port. However, this is good for test cases and if you want to try something very fast, but this is not what the final product should look like. The final product should be like this. So you, you have a domain name for application and you want a secure connection using HTTPS. So the way to do that is using Kubernetes component called ingress. So you'll have a my app ingress and instead of external service, you would instead have an internal service. So you would not open your application through the IP address and the port. And now if the request comes from the browser, it's going to first reach the ingress and ingress then will redirect it to the internal service. And then it will eventually end up with the pod. So now let's actually take a look and see how external service configuration looks like so that you have a practical understanding. So you have the service, which is of type load balancer. This means we are opening it to public by assigning an external IP address to the service. And this is the port number that user can access the application at. So basically the IP address, the external IP address and the port number that you specify here. Now with ingress, 
of course, it looks differently. So let's go uh, through the syntax of ingress. Basically, you have a kind ingress instead of a service. And in the specification where the whole configuration happens, you have so-called rules or routing rules. And this basically defines that the main address or all the requests to that host must be forwarded to an internal service. So this is the host that user will enter in the browser and in Ingress you just define a mapping. So what happens when that request to that host gets issued, you redirect it internally to a service. The path here basically means the URL path. So everything after the domain name, so slash whatever path comes up to that, you can define those rules here and we'll see some different examples of the path configuration later. And as you see here in this configuration, uh, we have a HTTP protocol. So later in this video, I'm going to show you how to configure HTTPS connection using Ingress component. So right now in the specification, we don't have anything configured for the secure connection. It's just HTTP. And one thing to note here is that this HTTP attribute here does not correspond to this one here. This is a protocol that the incoming request gets forwarded to, to the internal service. So this is actually the second step and not to confuse it with this one. And now let's see how the internal service to that ingress will look like. So basically backend is the target where the request, the incoming request will be redirected and the service name should correspond to the internal service name like this and the port should be the internal uh, service port. And as you see here, the only difference between the external and internal services is that here in internal service, I don't have the third port, which is the node port starting from 30,000. We now have that attribute here and the type is a default type, not a load balancer, but internal service type, which is cluster IP. So this should be a valid domain address. So you can just write anything here. It has to be first of all valid and you should map that domain name to IP address of the node that represents an entry point to your Kubernetes cluster. So for example, if you decide that one of the nodes inside the Kubernetes cluster is going to be the entry point, then you should map this to the AP address of that node. Or, and we will see that uh, later, if you configure a server outside of the Kubernetes cluster that will become the entry point to your Kubernetes cluster, then you should map this host name to the IP address of that server. So now that we saw what Kubernetes ingress components looks like, let's see how to actually configure ingress in the cluster. So remember this diagram I showed you at the beginning. So basically you have a pod service and corresponding ingress. Now, if you create that ingress component alone, that won't be uh, enough for ingress uh, routing rules to work. What you need in addition is an implementation for ingress and that implementation is called ingress controller. So the step one will be to install an ingress controllers, which is basically another pod or another set of pods that run on your node in your Kubernetes cluster and does evaluation and processing of ingress rules. So the YAML file that I showed you uh, with the ingress component is basically this part right here and this has to be additionally installed in Kubernetes cluster. So what is ingress controller um, exactly? The function of ingress controller is to evaluate all the rules that you have defined in your cluster and this way to manage all the redirections. So basically this will be the entry point in the cluster for all the requests to that domain or subdomain rules that you've configured. And this will evaluate all the rules because you may have 50 rules or 50 ingress components created in your cluster. It will evaluate all the rules and decide based on that, which forwarding rule applies for that specific request. So in order to install this implementation of ingress in your cluster, you have to decide which one of many different third party implementations um, you want to choose from. I'll put a link of the whole list in the description where you see different kinds of uh, ingress controllers you can choose from. 
There is one from Kubernetes itself, which is Kubernetes Nginx Ingress Controller, but there are others as well. So once you install Ingress Controller in your cluster, you're good to go create Ingress roles and the whole configuration is gonna work. So now that I've shown you how Ingress can be used in a Kubernetes cluster, there is one thing that I think is important to understand in terms of setting up the whole cluster to be able to receive external requests. Now, first of all, you have to consider the environment where your Kubernetes cluster is running. If you are using some cloud service provider, like um, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Lino, there are a couple more uh, that have out of the box Kubernetes solutions, um, or they have their own virtualized load balancers, etc. Your uh, cluster configuration would look something like this. So you would have a cloud load balancer that is specifically implemented by that cloud provider. And external requests coming from the browser will first hit the load balancer and that load balancer then will redirect the request to ingress controller. Now, this is not the only way to do it, even in cloud environment, you can do it in a in, in couple of different ways, but this is one of the most common uh, strategies. And advantage of using cloud provider for that is that you don't have to uh, implement a load balancer yourself. So with minimal effort, probably on most cloud providers, you will have the load balancer up and running and ready to receive those requests and forward those requests then to your Kubernetes cluster. So very easy setup. Now, if you're um, deploying your Kubernetes cluster on a bare metal environment, then you would have to do that part yourself. So basically you would have to configure some kind of entry point to your Kubernetes cluster yourself. And there's a whole list of different ways to do that. And I'm gonna put that also in the description. But generally speaking, either inside of a cluster or outside as a separate server, uh, you will have to provide an entry point. And one of those types is an external proxy server, uh, which can be a software or hardware solution that will take a role of that load balancer and entry point to your cluster. So basically what this would mean is that you will have a separate server and you would give this a public IP address and you would open the ports in order for the requests to be accepted. And this proxy server then will act as an entry point to your cluster. So this will be the only one accessible externally. So none of the servers in your Kubernetes cluster will have publicly accessible IP address, which is obviously a very good security practice. So all the requests will enter the proxy server and that will then redirect the request to ingress controller and ingress controller will then decide which ingress rule applies to that specific request and the whole internal request forwarding will happen. So as I said, there are different ways to configure that and to set it up depending on which environment you are and also which approach you choose. But I think it's a very important concept to understand how the whole cluster setup works. So in my case, since I'm using uh, Minikube to demonstrate all of this on my laptop, the setup will be pretty easy. And even though this might not apply exactly to your cluster setting, still you will see in practice how all these things work. So the first thing is to install Ingress Controller in Minikube. And the way to do that is by executing Minikube add-ons enable Ingress. So what this does is automatically configures or automatically starts the Kubernetes Nginx implementation of Ingress Controller. So that's one of the many third-party implementations, which you can also um, safely use in production environments, not just Minikube, but this is what Minikube actually offers you out of the box. So with one simple command, Ingress Controller will be configured in your cluster. And if you do kubectl get pod in a kube system namespace, you will see the Nginx Ingress Controller pod running in your cluster. So once I have Ingress Controller installed, now I can create an Ingress rule that the controller can evaluate. So let's actually head over to the command line where I'm gonna create Ingress rule for Kubernetes dashboard component. So in my Minikube cluster, I have Kubernetes dashboard, which is right now not accessible externally. 
So what I'm going to do is, since I already have internal service for Kubernetes dashboard and a pod for that, I'm going to configure an ingress rule for the dashboard. So I can access it from a browser using some domain name. So I'm going to... So this shows me all the components that I have in Kubernetes dashboard. And since I already have uh, internal service for Kubernetes dashboard and the pod that's running, I can now create an ingress uh, rule in order to access the Kubernetes dashboard using some uh, host name. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to create an ingress for Kubernetes dashboard. Um, so these are just metadata, the name, it's going to be dashboard ingress and the namespace is going to be in the same namespace as the service and pod. So in the specification, we are going to define the rules. So the first rule is the host name. I'm just going to call, I'm going to define dashboard.com and the HTTP forwarding to internal service path. Let's leave it at all path. And this is the backend of the service. So service name will be what we saw here. So this is the service name and service port is where the service listens. So this is actually 80 right here. And this will be it. That's the ingress configuration for uh, forwarding every request that is directed to dashboard.com to internal Kubernetes dashboard service. And we know it's internal because its type is cluster IP. So no external IP address. So obviously I just made up host name dashboard.com. It's not registered anywhere. And I also didn't configure anywhere which IP address this host name should resolve to. And this is something that you will always have to configure. So first of all, let's actually create that ingress rule. So kubectl apply and it's called dashboard ingress.yaml. See ingress was created. So if I do get ingress in the namespace, I should see my ingress here. And as you see, address is now empty because it takes a little bit of time to assign the address um, to ingress. So we'll have to wait for that to get the IP address that uh, will map to this host. So I'm just going to watch this and it's, I see that address was assigned. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to take that address and in my etc hosts file at the end I'm going to define that mapping so that IP address will be mapped to dashboard.com and again this works locally if I'm going to type dashboard.com in the browser this will be the IP address that it's going to be uh, mapped to uh, which basically means that the request will come into my minikube cluster, will be handed over to ingress controller and ingress controller then will go and evaluate this rule that I've defined here and forward that request to the service. So this is all the configuration we need. So now I'm going to go and, and enter dashboard.com and I will see my Kubernetes dashboard here. So ingress also has something called a default backend. So if I do kubectl describe ingress, the name of the ingress and the namespace, I'll get this output. And here there's an attribute called default backend that maps to default HTTP backend um, port 80. So what this means is that whenever a request comes into the Kubernetes cluster that is not mapped to any backend, so there is no rule for mapping that request uh, to, an, to a service, then this default backend is used to handle that uh, request. So obviously, if you don't have this service created or defined um, in your cluster, Kubernetes 
will try to forward it to the service, it won't find it, and you would get some um, default error response. So for example, if I um, entered some path that I haven't configured, I just get page not found. So a good usage for that is to define custom error messages when a page isn't found, when a request comes in that you can't handle or the application can handle, so that the user still sees some meaningful error message or just a custom page where you can redirect them to your home page or something like this. So all you have to do is create an internal service with the same name, so default HTTP backend and the port number and also create a pod or application that uh, sends that error, custom error message response. So till now I have shown you what Ingress is and how you can use it. I've also shown you a demo of how to create an Ingress rule in Minikube, but we've used only a very basic uh, Ingress YAML configuration. Just a simple forwarding to one internal service with one path. But you can do much more with Ingress configuration than just basic uh, forwarding. And in the next section, we're gonna go through more use cases of how you can define uh, more fine granular routing for applications inside a Kubernetes cluster. So the first thing is defining multiple paths of the same host. So consider following use case. Google has one domain but has many services that it offers. So for example, if you have a Google account, you can use its analytics, you can use its shopping, you, you have a calendar, you have a Gmail, etc. So all of these are separate applications uh, that are accessible with the same domain. So consider you have an application that does something similar. So you offer two separate applications that are part of the same ecosystem, but you still want to have them on separate URLs. So what you can do is that in rules, you can define the host, which is myapp.com. And in the path section, you can define multiple paths. So if user wants to access your analytics application, then they have to enter myapp.com slash analytics, and that will forward the request to internal and analytics service and the pod. Or if they want to access the shopping application, then the URL for that will be myapp.com slash shopping. So this way you can do forwarding with one ingress of the same host to multiple applications using multiple paths. Another use case is when instead of using URLs to make different applications accessible, some companies use subdomains. So instead of having myapp.com slash analytics, they create a subdomain analytics.myapp.com. So if you have your application configured that way, your configuration will look like this. So instead of having one host, like in the previous example, and multiple path here inside, now you have multiple hosts, where each host represents a subdomain. And inside you just have one path that, again, redirects the request to analytic service. Pretty straightforward. So now in the same request setting, you have analytic service and a pod behind it, now the request will look like this using the subdomain instead of path. And one final topic that I mentioned that we'll cover here is configuring TLS certificate. Till now we've only seen ingress configuration for HTTP requests, but it's super easy to configure HTTPS forwarding in ingress. So the only thing that you need to do is define attribute called TLS above the rules section with host, which is the same host as right here, and the secret name, which is a reference of a secret that you have to create in a cluster that holds that TLS certificate. So the secret configuration would look like uh, this. So the name is the reference right here, and the data or the actual contents contain TLS certificate and TLS key. If you've seen my other videos where I create different components like secret, you probably noticed the type, additional type attribute here. In Kubernetes, there is a specific type of a secret called TLS. So we'll have to use that type when you create a TLS secret. And there are three small notes to, to be made here. 
One is that the keys of this data have to be named exactly like that. The values are the actual file contents of the certificate or key contents and not the file path or location. So you have to put the whole content here, base64 encoded. And the third one is that you have to create the secret in the same namespace as the ingress component for it to be able to use that. Otherwise, you can't reference a secret from another namespace. And these four lines is all you need to configure mapping of an HTTPS request to that host to internal service. In this video, I'm going to explain all the main concepts of Helm so that you're able to use it in your own projects. Also, Helm changes a lot from version to version. So understanding the basic common principles and more importantly, its use cases to when and why we use Helm will make it easier for you to use it in practice, no matter which version you choose. So the topics I'm going to go through in this video are Helm and Helm charts, uh, what they are, how to use them and in which scenarios they're used and also what is Tiller and what part it plays in the Helm architecture. So what is Helm? Helm has a couple of main features that it's used for. The first one is as a package manager for Kubernetes. So you can think of it as apt, or yum or homebrew for Kubernetes. So it's a convenient way for packaging collections of Kubernetes YAML files and distributing them in public and private registry. Now these definitions may sound a bit abstract, so let's break them down with specific examples. So let's say you have deployed your application in Kubernetes cluster and you want to deploy Elasticsearch additionally in your cluster that your application will use to collect its logs. In order to deploy Elastic Stack in your Kubernetes cluster, you would need a couple of Kubernetes components. So you would need a stateful set, which is for stateful applications like databases. You would need a config map, with external configuration, you would need a secret where some credentials um, and secret data are stored. You would need to create the Kubernetes user with its respective permissions um, and also create a couple of services. Now, if you were to create all of these files manually by searching for each one of them separately on internet, it would be a tedious job. And until you have all these YAML files collected and tested and tried out, it might take some time. And since Elastic Stack deployment is pretty much the standard across all clusters, other people will probably have to go through the same. So it made perfect sense that someone created these YAML files once and packaged them up and made it available somewhere so that other people who also use the same kind of deployment could use them in their Kubernetes cluster. And that bundle of YAML files is called Helm chart. So using Helm, you can create your own Helm charts or bundles of those YAML files and push them to some Helm repository to make it available for others. Or you can consume, so you can use, download and use existing Helm charts that other people pushed and made available in different repositories. So commonly used deployments like database applications, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, MySQL, or monitoring applications like Prometheus that all have this kind of complex setup, all have charts available in some Helm repository. So using a simple Helm install chart name command, you can reuse the configuration that someone else has already made without additional effort. And sometimes that someone is even the company that created the application. And this functionality of sharing charts that became pretty widely used actually was one of the contributors to why Helm became so popular compared to its alternative tools. So now if you're, if you have a cluster and you need some kind of deployment that you think should be available out there, you can actually look it up either using command line. So you can do Helm search with a keyword, or you can go to either Helm's own public repository, Helm hub, or on Helm charts, pages, or other repositories that are available. 
and I will put all the relevant links for this video in the description so you can check them out. Now, apart from those public registries for Helm charts, there are also private registries because when companies started creating those charts, they also started distributing them among or internally in the organization. So it made perfect sense to create registries to share those charts within the organization and not publicly. So there are a couple of tools out there that are used as Helm chart private repositories as well. Another functionality of Helm is that it's a templating engine. So what does that actually mean? Imagine you have an application that is made up of multiple microservices and you're deploying all of them in your Kubernetes cluster. And deployment and service of each of those microservices are pretty much the same with the only difference that the application name and version are different or the Docker image name and version tags are different. So without Helm, you would write separate YAML files, configuration files for each of those microservices. So we, you would have multiple deployment service files where each one has its own application name and version defined. But since the only difference between those YAML files are just a couple of lines or a couple of values using Helm, what you can do is that you can define a common blueprint for all the microservices and the values that are dynamic or the values that are going to change replace by placeholders. And that would be a template file. So the template file would look something like this. You would have a template file, which is standard YAML, but instead of values, in some places you would have the syntax, which means that you're taking a value from external configuration. And that external configuration, if you see the syntax here, dot values, that external configuration comes from an additional YAML file, which is called values.yaml. And here you can define all those values that you're gonna use in that template file. So for example, here, those four values are defined in a values YAML file. And what dot values is, it's an object that is being created based on the values that are supplied by a values YAML file and also through a command line using dash dash set flag. So whichever way you define those additional values, they're combined and put together in dot values object that you can then use in those template files to get the values out. So now instead of having YAML files for each microservice, you just have one and you can simply replace those values uh, dynamically. And this is especially practical when you're using continuous delivery, continuous integration for your application. Because what you can do is that in your build pipeline, you can use those template YAML files and replace the values on the fly before deploying them. Another use case where you can use the Helm features of package manager and templating engine is when you deploy the same set of applications across different Kubernetes clusters. So consider a use case where you have your microservice application that you want to deploy on development, staging and production clusters. So instead of deploying the individual YAML files separately in each cluster, you can package them up to make your own application chart that will have all the necessary YAML files that that particular deployment needs. And then you can use them to redeploy the same application in different Kubernetes cluster environments using one command, which can also make the whole deployment process easier. So now that you know what Helm charts are used for it, let's actually look at an example Helm chart structure to have a better understanding. So typically chart is made up of such a directory structure. So it would have the top level will be the name of the chart and inside the directory you would have following. So chart.yaml is basically a file that contains all the meta information about the chart. It could be name and version, maybe list of dependencies, etc. Values.yaml that I mentioned before is place where all the values are con configured for the template files. Uh, and this will actually be the default values. 
that you can override later. The charts directory will have chart dependencies inside, meaning that if this chart depends on other charts, then those chart dependencies will be stored here. And templates folder is basically where the template files are stored. So when you execute helm install command to actually deploy those YAML files into Kubernetes, the template files from here will be filled with the values from uh, values.yaml producing valid Kubernetes manifest that can then be deployed into Kubernetes. And optionally, you can have some other files in this folder, like a readme or a license file, etc. So to have a better understanding of how values are injected into Helm templates, consider that in values.yaml, which is a default value configuration, you have following three values, image name, port and version. And as I mentioned, the default values that are uh, defined here can be overridden in a couple of different ways. One way is that when executing Helm install command, you can provide an alternative values YAML file using values flag. So for example, if values YAML file will have following three values, which are image name, port and version, you can define your own values YAML file called myvalues.yaml and you can override one of those values or you can even add some new attributes there. And those two will be merged which will result into a dot values object that will look like this. So it would have image name and port from values.yaml and the one that you overrode with your own values uh, file. Alternatively, you can also provide additional individual values using set flag, where you can define the values directly on the command line. But of course, it's more organized and better manageable to have files where you store all those values instead of just providing them on the command line. Another feature of Helm is release management, which is provided based on its setup. But it's important to note here the difference between Helm versions 2 and 3. In version 2 of Helm, the Helm installation comes in two parts. You have Helm client and the server. And the server part is called Tiller. So whenever you deploy Helm chart using Helm install my chart, Helm client will send the YAML files to Tiller that actually runs or has to run in a Kubernetes cluster. And Tiller then will execute this request and create components from these YAML files inside the Kubernetes cluster. And exactly this architecture offers additional valuable feature of Helm, which is release management. So the way Helm client server setup works is that whenever you create or change deployment, Pillar will store a copy of each configuration client sent for future reference, thus creating a history of chart executions. So when you execute Helm upgrade the chart name, the changes will be applied to the existing deployment instead of removing it and creating a new one. And also, in case the upgrade goes wrong, for example, some YAML files were false or some configuration was wrong, you can roll back that upgrade using Helm rollback chart name command. And all of this is possible because of that chart execution history that Tiller keeps whenever you send those requests from Helm client to Tiller. However, this setup has a big caveat, which is that Tiller has too much power inside the Kubernetes cluster. Um, it can create, update, delete components, and it has too much permissions. And this makes it actually a big security issue. And this was one of the reasons why in Helm 3, they actually removed the Tiller part. And it's just a simple Helm binary now. And it's important to mention here because a lot of people have heard of Tiller. And when you deploy a Helm version 3, you shouldn't be confused that Tiller isn't actually there anymore. In this video, I will show you how you can persist data in Kubernetes using volumes. We will cover three components of Kubernetes storage, persistent volume, persistent volume claim, and storage class, and see what each component does and how it's created and used 
for data persistence. Consider a case where you have a MySQL database pod which your application uses. Data gets added, updated in the database. Maybe you create a new database with a new user, etc. But default, when you restart the pod, all those changes will be gone because Kubernetes doesn't give you data persistence out of the box. That's something that you have to explicitly configure for each application that needs saving data between pod restarts. So basically you need a storage that doesn't depend on the pod lifecycle. So it will still be there when pod dies and new one gets created. So the new pod can pick up where the previous one left off. So it will read the existing data from that storage to get up to date data. However, you don't know on which node the new pod restarts. So your storage must also be available on all nodes, not just one specific one. So that when the new pod tries to read the existing data, the up-to-date data is there on any node in the cluster. And also you need a highly available storage that will survive even if the whole cluster crashed. So these are the criteria or the requirements that your storage, for example, your database storage will need to have um, to be reliable. Another use case for persistent storage, which is not for database, is a directory. Maybe you have an application that writes and reads files from pre-configured directory. Uh, this could be session files for application or configuration files, etc. And you can configure any of this type of storage using Kubernetes component called persistent volume. Think of a persistent volume as a cluster resource, just like RAM or CPU that is used to store data. Persistent volume, just like any other component, gets created using Kubernetes YAML file, where you can specify the kind, which is persistent volume, and in the specification section, you have to define um, different parameters, like how much storage should be created for the volume. But since Persistent volume is just an abstract component. It must take the storage from the actual physical storage, right? Like local hard drive from the cluster nodes or your external NFS servers outside of the cluster or maybe cloud storage like AWS uh, block storage or from Google Cloud storage, etc. So the question is, where does this storage backend come from? Local or remote or on cloud, who configures it? who makes it available to the cluster. And that's the tricky part of data persistence in Kubernetes because Kubernetes doesn't care about your actual storage. It gives you persistent volume component as an interface to the actual storage that you as a maintainer or administrator have to take care of. So you have to decide what type of storage your cluster services or applications would need and create and manage them by yourself. Managing meaning do backups and make sure they don't get corrupt, etc. So think of storage in Kubernetes as an external plugin to your cluster. Whether it's a local storage on the actual nodes where the cluster is running or a remote storage, doesn't matter, they're all plugins to the cluster. And you can have multiple storages configured for your cluster where one application in your cluster uses local disk storage, another one uses the NFS server, and another one uses some cloud storage, or one application may also use multiple of those storage types. And by creating persistent volumes, you can use these actual physical storages. So in the persistent volume specification section, you can define which storage backend you want to use to create that storage abstraction or storage resource for your applications. So this is an example where we use NFS storage backend. So basically we define how much storage we need, um, some additional parameters to that storage, like should it be read, write or read only, etc., and the storage backend with its parameters. Um, and this is another example where we use Google cloud as a storage backend again with the storage backend specified here and capacity and access modes here. Now, obviously, depending on the storage type on the storage backend, 
some of the attributes in the specification will be different because they're specific to the storage type. Um, this is another example of a local storage, which is on the node itself, uh, which has additional node affinity attribute. Now, you don't have to remember and know all these attributes um, at once because you may, may not need all of them. And also, I will make separate videos covering some of the most used volumes and explain them individually with examples and demos. So there I'm going to explain in more detail which um, attributes should be used for these specific volumes and what they actually mean. In the official Kubernetes documentation, you can actually see the complete list of more than 25 storage backends that Kubernetes supports. Note here that persistent volumes are not namespaced, meaning they're accessible to the whole cluster. And unlike other components that we saw like pods and services, they're not in any namespace. They're just available to the whole cluster to all the namespaces. Now it's important to differentiate here between two categories of the volumes, local and remote. Each volume type in these two categories has its own use case. Otherwise they won't exist. And we will see some of these use cases later in this video. However, the local volume types violate the second and third requirements of data persistence for databases that I mentioned at the beginning, which is one not being tied to one specific node, but rather to each node equally, because you don't know where the new pod will start. And the second surviving in cluster crash scenarios. Because of these reasons for database persistence, you should almost always use remote storage. So who creates these persistent volumes and when? As I said, persistent volumes are resources like CPU or RAM. So they have to be already there in the cluster when the pod that depends on it or that uses it is created. So a side note here is that there are two main roles in Kubernetes. There's an administrator who sets up the cluster and maintains it and also makes sure the cluster has enough resources. These are usually system administrators or DevOps engineers and a company. And the second role is Kubernetes user that deploys the applications in the cluster either directly or through CI pipeline. These are developer DevOps teams who create the applications and deploy them. So in this case, the Kubernetes administrator would be the one to configure the actual storage, meaning to make sure that the NFS server storage is there and configured, or maybe create and configure a cloud storage that will be available for the cluster. And second, create persistent volume components from these storage backends based on the information from developer team of what types of storage their applications would need. And the developers then will know that storage is there and can be used by their applications. But for that, developers have to explicitly configure the application YAML file to use those persistent volume components. In other words, application has to claim that volume storage. And you do that using another component of Kubernetes called persistent volume claim. Persistent volume claims, also PVCs, are also created with YAML configuration. Here's an example claim. Again, don't worry about understanding each and every attribute that is defined here. But on the higher level, the way it works is that PVC claims a volume with certain storage size or capacity, which is defined in the persistent volume claim and some additional characteristics like access type, should it be read only or read write or the type, etc. And whatever persistent volume matches this criteria, or in other words, satisfies this claim will be used for the application. But that's not all. You have to now use that claim in your pods configuration like this. So in the pod specification here, you have the volumes um, attribute that references the persistent volume claim with its name. So now the pod and all the containers inside the pod will have access to that persistent volume storage. So to go through those levels of abstraction step by step, pods 
excess storage by using the claim as a volume, right? So they request the volume through claim. The claim then will go and try to find a volume, persistent volume in the cluster that satisfies the claim. And the volume will have a storage, the actual storage backend um, that it will create that storage resource from. And this way the pod will now be able to use that actual storage backend. Note here that claims must exist in the same namespace as the pod using the claim. While, as I mentioned before, persistent volumes are not namespaced. So once the pod finds the matching persistent volume through the volume claim, through the persistent volume claim, the volume is then mounted into the pod like this here. This is a pod level. And then that volume can be mounted into the container inside the pod, which is this level right here. And if you have multiple containers here in the pod, you can decide to mount this volume in all the containers or just some of those. So now the container and the application inside the container can read and write to that storage. And when the pod dies and new one gets created, it will have access to the same storage and see all the changes the previous pod or the previous containers made. Again, the attributes here like volumes and volume miles, etc., and how they're used, I will show you more specifically and explain in a later demo video. Now, you may be wondering why so many abstractions for using volume, where admin role has to create persistent volume and user role creates a claim on that persistent volume and that isn't used in pod. Can I just use one component and configure everything there? Well, this actually has a benefit because as a user, meaning a developer who just wants to deploy their application in the cluster, you don't care about where the actual storage is. You know you want your database to have persistence and whether the data will live on the Gluster FS or AWS EBS or local storage doesn't matter for you as long as the data is safely stored. Or if you need a directory storage for files, you don't care where the directory actually lives as long as it has enough space and works properly. And you sure don't want to care about setting up these actual storages yourself. You just want 50 gigabyte storage for your Elastic or 10 gigabyte for your application, that's it. So you make a claim for storage using PVC and assume that cluster has storage resources already there. And this makes deploying the applications easier for developers because they don't have to take care of the stuff beyond deploying the applications. Now there are two volume types that I think needs to be mentioned separately because they're a bit different from the rest and these are config map and secret. Now, if you have watched my other video on Kubernetes components, then you are already familiar with both. Both of them are local volumes, but unlike the rest, these two aren't created via PV and PVC, but are rather own components and managed by Kubernetes itself. Consider a case where you need a configuration file for your Prometheus pod or maybe a message broker service like Mosquito, or consider when you need a certificate file mounted inside your application. In both cases, you need a file available to your pod. So how this works is that you create config map or secret component, and you can mount that into your pod and into your container the same way as you would mount persistent volume claim. So instead you would have a config map or secret here. And I will show you a demo of this in a video where I cover local volume types. So to quickly summarize what we've covered so far, as we see at its core, a volume is just a directory, possibly with some data in it, which is accessible to the containers in a pod. How that directory is made available or what storage medium actually backs that and the contents of the directory are defined by a specific volume type you use. So to use a volume, a pod specifies what volumes to provide for the pod in the specification volumes attribute. And inside the pod, then you can decide where to mount that storage into using volume mounts attribute inside the container section.
And this is a path inside the container where application can access whatever storage we mounted into the container. And as I said, if you have multiple containers, you can decide which container should get access to that storage. Interesting note for you is that a pod can actually use multiple volumes of different types simultaneously. Let's say you have an Elasticsearch uh, application or pod running in your cluster that needs a configuration file mounted through a config map, uh, needs a certificate, uh, let's say a client certificate uh, mounted as a secret, and it needs database storage, let's say, which is backed with AWS um, Elastic block storage. So in this case, you can configure all three inside your pod or deployment. So this is the pod specification that we saw before. And here on the volumes level, you will just list all the volumes that you want to mount into your pod. So let's say you have a persistent volume claim that in the background claims persistent volume from AWS block storage. And here you have the config map and here have a secret. And here in the volume mounts, you can list all those uh, storage mounts using the names, right? So you have the persistent storage, then you have the config map and the secret, and each one of them is mounted to a certain path inside the container. Now we saw that to persist data in Kubernetes, admins need to configure storage for the cluster, create persistent volumes and developers then can claim them using PVCs. But consider a cluster with hundreds of applications where things get deployed daily and storage is needed for these applications. So developers need to ask admins to create persistent volumes they need for applications before deploying them. And admins then may have to manually request storage from cloud or storage provider and create hundreds of persistent volumes for all the applications that need storage manually. And that can be tedious, time consuming and can get messy very quickly. So to make this process more efficient, there is a third component of Kubernetes persistence called storage class. Storage class basically creates or provisions persistent volumes dynamically whenever PVC claims it. And this way, creating or provisioning volumes in a cluster may be automated. Storage class also gets created using YAML configuration file. So this is an example file where we have the kind storage class. Storage class creates persistent volumes dynamically in the background. So remember, we define storage backend in the persistent volume component. Now we have to define it in the storage class component. And we do that using the provisioner attribute, which is the main part of the storage class configuration because it tells Kubernetes which provisioner to be used for a specific storage platform or cloud provider to create the persistent volume component out of it. So each storage backend has its own provisioner that Kubernetes offers internally, which are prefixed with Kubernetes.io, like this one here. And these are internal provisioners. And for others or other storage types, they are external provisioners that you have to then explicitly go and find and use that in your storage class. And in addition to provisioner attribute, we configure parameters of the storage we want to request for our persistent volume, like this one's here. So storage class is basically another abstraction level that abstracts the underlying storage provider as well as parameters for that storage, or characteristics for the storage, like what disk type or etc. So how does it work or how do we use storage class in the pod configuration? Same as persistent volume, it is requested or claimed by PVC. So in the PVC configuration here, we add additional attribute that is called storage class name that references the storage class to be used to create a persistent volume that satisfies the claims of this PVC. So now when a pod claims storage through PVC, the PVC will request that storage from storage class, which then will provision or create 
persistent volume that meets the needs of that claim using provisioner from the actual storage backend. Now this should help you understand the concepts of how data is persisted in Kubernetes as a high level overview. In this video, we're going to talk about what stateful set is in Kubernetes and what purpose it has. So what is stateful set? It's a Kubernetes component that is used specifically for stateful applications. So in order to understand that, first you need to understand what a stateful application is. Examples of stateful applications are all databases like MySQL, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, etc or any application that stores data to keep track of its state. In other words, these are applications that track state by saving that information in some storage. Stateless applications, on the other hand, do not keep records of previous interaction and each request or interaction is handled as a completely new isolated interaction based entirely on the information that comes with it. And sometimes stateless applications connect to the stateful application to forward those requests. So imagine a simple setup of a Node.js application that is connected to MongoDB database. When a request comes in to the Node.js application, it doesn't depend on any previous data to handle this incoming request. It can handle it based on the payload in the request itself. Now a typical such request will additionally need to update some data in the database or query the data. That's where MongoDB comes in. So when Node.js forwards that request to MongoDB, MongoDB will update the data based on its previous state or query the data from its storage. So for each request, it needs to handle data and obviously always depends on the most up-to-date data or state to be available. While Node.js is just a pass through for data updates or queries and it just processes code. Now, because of this difference between stateful and stateless applications, they're both deployed in different ways using different components in Kubernetes. Stateless applications are deployed using deployment component, but deployment is an abstraction of pods and allows you to replicate that application meaning run two, five, 10 identical pods of the same stateless application in the cluster. So while stateless applications are deployed using deployment, stateful applications in Kubernetes are deployed using stateful set components. And just like deployment, stateful set makes it possible to replicate the stateful app pods or to run multiple replicas of it. In other words, they both manage pods that are based on an identical container specification. And you can also configure storage with both of them equally in the same way. So if both manage the replication of pods and also configuration of data persistence in the same way, the question is what a lot of people ask and are also often confused about, what is the difference between those two components? Why we use different ones uh, for each type of application? So in the next section, we're going to talk about the differences. Now, replicating stateful application is more difficult and has a couple of requirements that stateless applications do not have. So let's look at this first with the example of a MySQL database. Let's say you have one MySQL database pod that handles requests from a Java application which is deployed using a deployment component. And let's say you scale the Java application to three pods so they can handle more client requests. In parallel, you want to scale MySQL app so it can handle more Java requests as well. Scaling your Java application here is pretty straightforward. Java applications replica pods will be identical and interchangeable. So you can scale it using a deployment pretty easily. Deployment will create the pods in any order, in any random order. They will get random hashes at the end of the pod name. They will get one service that load balances to any one of the replica pods for any request. And also when you delete them, they get deleted in a random order or at the same time, right? Or when you scale them down from three to two replicas, for example, one random replica pod gets chosen to be deleted. So no complications there. 
On the other hand, MySQL pod replicas cannot be created and deleted at the same time in any order and they can't be randomly addressed. And the reason for that is because the replica pods are not identical. In fact, they each have their own additional identity on top of the common blueprint of the pod that they get created from. And giving each pod its own required individual identity is actually what stateful set does different from deployment. It maintains a sticky identity for each of its pods. And as I said, these pods are created from the same specification, but they're not interchangeable. Each has a persistent identifier that it maintains across any rescheduling. So meaning when pod dies and it gets replaced by a new pod, it keeps that identity. So the question you may be asking now is why do these pods need their own identities? Why they can't be interchangeable just like with deployment? So why is that? And this is a concept that you need to understand about scaling database applications in general. When you start with a single MySQL pod, it will be used for both reading and writing data. But when you add a second one, it cannot act the same way. Because if you allow two independent instances of MySQL to change the same data, you will end up with data inconsistency. So instead, there is a mechanism that decides that only one pod is allowed to write or change the data which is shared, reading at the same time by multiple pods, MySQL instances uh, from the same data is completely fine. And the pod that is allowed to update the data is called the master. The others are called slaves. So this is the first thing that differentiates these pods from each other. So not all pods are same, identical, but there is a master pod and they're the slave pods, right? And there is also difference between those slave pods in terms of storage, which is the next point. So the thing is that these pods do not have access to the same physical storage. Even though they use the same data, they're not using the same physical storage of the data. They each have their own replicas of the storage that each one of them can access for itself. And this means that each pod replica at any time must have the same data as the other ones. And in order to achieve that, they have to continuously synchronize their data. And since master is the only one allowed to change data and the slaves need to take care of their own data storage, obviously the slaves must know about each such change so they can update their own data storage to be up to date for the next query requests. And there is a mechanism in such clustered database setup that allows for continuous data synchronization. Master changes data and all slaves update their own data storage to keep in sync and to make sure that each pod has the same state. Now let's say you have one master and two slave uh, pods of MySQL. Now what happens when a new pod replica joins the existing setup? Because now that new pod also needs to create its own storage and then take care of synchronizing it. What happens is that it first clones the data from the previous pod, not just any pod in the, in the setup, but always from the previous pod. And once it has the up-to-date data cloned, it starts continuous synchronization as well to listen for any updates by master pod. And this also means, and I want to point this out since it's a pretty interesting point, it means that you can actually have a temporary storage for a stateful application and not persist the data at all since the data gets replicated between the pods. So theoretically, it is possible to just rely on data replication between the pods. But this will also mean that the whole data will be lost when all the pods die. So for example, if stateful set gets deleted or the cluster crashes or all the nodes where these pod replicas are running crash and every pod dies at the same time, the data will be gone. And therefore, it's still a best practice to use data persistence for stateful applications if losing the data will be unacceptable, which is the case in most database applications. And with persistent storage, data will survive even if all the pods of the stateful set die. Or even if you delete the complete stateful set component and all the pods get wiped out as well, the persistent storage and the data will still remain.
because persistent volume uh, life cycle isn't connected or isn't tied to a life cycle of other components like deployment or uh, stateful set. And the way to do this is configuring persistent volumes for your stateful set. And since each pod has its own data storage, meaning it's the own persistent volume that is then backed up by its own physical storage, which includes the synchronized data or the replicated database data, but also the state of the pod. So each pod has its own state, which has information about whether it's a master pod or a slave or other individual characteristics. And all of this gets stored in the pod's own storage. And that means when a pod dies and gets replaced, the persistent pod identifiers make sure that the storage volume gets reattached to the replacement pod. As I said, because that storage has the state of the pod in addition to that replicated data. I mean, it can clone the data again, that will be no problem, but it shouldn't lose its state or identity state, so to say. And for this reattachment to work, it's important to use a remote storage because if the pod gets rescheduled from one node to another node, the previous storage must be available on the other node as well. And you cannot do that using local volume storage because they are usually tied to a specific node. And the last difference between deployment and um, stateful set is something that I mentioned before is the pod identifier, meaning that every pod has its own identifier. So unlike deployment, where pods get random hashes at the end, stateful set pods get fixed ordered names, which is made up of the stateful set name and an ordinal. It starts from zero and each additional pod will get the next numeral. So if you create a stateful set called MySQL with three replicas, you'll have pods with names MySQL 0, 1, and 2. The first one is the master, and then come the slaves in the order of startup. An important note here is that the stateful set will not create the next pod in the replica if the previous one isn't already up and running. If first pod uh, creation, for example, failed, or if it was pending, the next one won't get created at all. It would just wait. And the same order is held in deletion, but in reverse order. So for example, if you deleted the stateful set, or if you scaled it down to one, for example, from three, the deletion will start from the last pod. So MySQL 2 will get deleted first. It will wait until that pod is successfully deleted and then it will delete MySQL 1, and then it will delete MySQL 0. And again, all these mechanisms are in place in order to protect the data and the state that the stateful application depends on. In addition to these fixed predictable names, each pod in a stateful set gets its own DNS endpoint from a service. So there's a service name for the stateful application, just like for deployment, for example, that will address any replica pod and plus in addition to that there is individual dns name for each pod which deployment pods do not have the individual dns names are made up of the pod name and the manage or the governing service name which is basically a service name that you define inside the stateful set so these two characteristics meaning having a predictable or fixed name as well as its fixed individual DNS name means that when pod restarts, the IP address will change, but the name and endpoint will stay the same. That's why I said pods get sticky identities. So it gets stuck to it even between the restarts. And the sticky identity makes sure that each replica pod can retain its state and its role even when it dies and gets recreated. And finally, I want to mention an important point here. As you see, replicating stateful apps like databases with its persistent storage requires a complex mechanism. And Kubernetes helps you and supports you to set this whole thing up, but you still need to do a lot by yourself where Kubernetes doesn't actually help you or doesn't provide you out of the box solutions. For example, you need to configure the cloning and data synchronization inside the stateful set and also make the remote storage available as well as take care of managing and backing it up. All of this you have to do yourself. 
And the reason is that stateful applications are not a perfect candidate for containerized environments. In fact, Docker, Kubernetes, and generally containerization is perfectly fitting for stateless applications that do not have any state and data dependency and only process code. So scaling and replicating them in containers is super easy. In this video, I will give you a complete overview of Kubernetes services. First, I'll explain shortly what service component is in Kubernetes and when we need it. And then we'll go through the different service types, cluster IP service, headless service, node port, and load balancer services. I will explain the differences between them and when to use which one. So by the end of the video, you will have a great understanding of Kubernetes services and we'll be able to use them in practice. So let's get started. So what is a service in Kubernetes and why do we need it? In a Kubernetes cluster, each pod gets its own internal IP address, but the pods in Kubernetes are ephemeral, meaning that they come and go very frequently. And when the pod restarts or when the old one dies and the new one gets started in its place, it gets a new IP address. So it doesn't make sense to use pod IP addresses directly because then you would have to adjust that every time the pod gets recreated. With a service, however, you have a solution of a stable or static IP address that stays even when the pod dies. So basically in front of each pod, we set a service, which represents a persistent stable IP address access that pod. A service also provides load balancing because when you have pod replicas, for example, three replicas of your microservice application or three replicas of MySQL application, the service will basically get each request targeted to that MySQL or your microservice application and then forward it to one of those pods. So clients can call a single stable IP address instead of calling each pod individually. So services are a good abstraction for loose coupling for communication within the cluster. So within the cluster components or pods inside the cluster, but also from external services. Like if you have browser requests coming to the cluster, or if you're talking to an external database, for example, there are several types of services in Kubernetes. The first and the most common one that you're probably will use most of the time is the cluster IP type. This is a default type of a service, meaning when you create a service and not specify a type, it will automatically take cluster IP as a type. So let's see how cluster IP works and where it's used in Kubernetes setup. Imagine we have a microservice application deployed in the cluster. So we have a pod with microservice container running inside that pod. And beside that microservice container, we have a sidecar container that collects the logs of the microservice and then sends that to some destination database. So these two containers are running in the pod. And let's say your microservice container is running at pod 3000 and your logging container, let's say is running on port 9000. This means that those two ports will be now open and accessible inside the pod. And pod will also get an IP address from a range that is assigned to a node. So the way it works is that if you have, for example, three worker nodes in your Kubernetes cluster, each worker node will get a range of IP addresses, which are internal in the cluster. So for example, the pod one will get IP addresses from a range of 10, 0.2.1 onwards. The second worker node will get this IP range and the third worker node will get this one. So let's say this pod starts on node two. So it get an IP address that looks like this. If you want to see the IP addresses of your pods in the cluster, you can actually check them using kubectl get pod output wide command where you will get some extra information about the pods, including its IP address. And here you will see the IP address that it got assigned. And as I mentioned, these are from the IP address range that each worker node in the cluster will get. So this is from the first worker node and these are from the second worker node. So now we can access those containers inside the pod at this IP address 
at these ports. If we set the replica count to two, we're going to have another pod which is identical to the first one, which will open the same ports and it will get a different IP address. Let's say if it starts on worker node one, it will get an IP address that looks something like this. Now, let's say this microservice is accessible through a browser. So we have ingress configured and the requests coming in from the browser to the microservice will be handled by ingress. How does this incoming request get forwarded from ingress all the way to the pod? And that happens through a service, a cluster IP or so-called internal service. A service in Kubernetes is a component just like a pod, but it's not a process. It's just an abstraction layer that basically represents an IP address. So service will get an IP address that it is accessible at. And service will also be accessible at a certain port. Let's say we define that port to be 3200. So ingress will talk to the service or hand over the request to the service at this IP address at this port. So this is how service is accessible within the cluster. So the way it works is that we define ingress rules that forward the request based on the request address to certain services. And we define the service by its name and the DNS resolution then maps that service name to an IP address that the service actually got assigned. So this is how ingress knows how to talk to the service. So once the request gets handed over to the service at this address, then service will know to forward that request to one of those pods that are registered as the service endpoints. Now here are two questions. How does service know which pods it is managing or which pods to forward the request to? And the second one is how does service know which port to forward that request to on that specific pod. The first one is defined by selectors. A service identifies its member pods or its endpoint pods using a selector attribute. So in the service specification, in the YAML file from which we create the service, we specify the selector attribute that has a key value pairs defined as a list. Now these key value pairs are basically labels that pods should have to match that selector. So in the pod configuration file, we assign the pod certain labels in the metadata section. And these labels can be arbitrary names. So we can say my app, for example, and give it some other labels. This is basically something that we define ourselves. We can give it any name that we want. These are just key value pairs that identify a set of pods. And in the service YAML file, then we define a selector to match any pod that has all of these labels. This means if we have a deployment component that creates three replicas of pods with label called app my app and type microservice, for example, and in the service selector attribute, we define those two labels, then service will match all of those three pod replicas and it will register all three pods as its endpoints. And as I said, it should match all the selectors, not just one. So this is how service will know which pods belong to it, meaning where to forward that request to. The second question was if a pod has multiple ports open where two different applications are listening inside the pod, how does service know which port to forward the request to? And this is defined in the target port attribute. So this target port attribute. So let's say target port in our example is 3000. What this means is that when we create the service, it will find all the pods that match this selector. So these pods will become endpoints of the service. And when the service gets a request, it will pick one of those pod replicas randomly because it's a load balancer and it will send the request it received to that specific pod on a port defined by target port attribute. In this case, 3000. Also note that when you create a service, Kubernetes creates an endpoints object that has the same name as the service itself. And Kubernetes will use this endpoints object to keep track of which pods are members of the service. 
or as I said, which pods are the endpoints of the service. And since this is dynamic, because whenever you create a new pod replica or a pod dies, the endpoints get updated. So this object will basically track that. And note here that the service port itself is arbitrary, so you can define it yourself. Whereas the target port is not arbitrary. It has to match the port where container, the application container inside the pod is listening at. Now let's say our microservice application got its requests from the browser through ingress and internal cluster IP service. And now it needs to communicate with the database to handle that request, for example. And in our example, let's assume that the microservice application uses MongoDB database. So we have two replicas of MongoDB in the cluster, which also have their own service endpoint. So MongoDB service is also of cluster IP and it has its own IP address. So now the microservice application inside the pod can talk to the MongoDB database also using the service endpoint. So the request will come from one of the pods that gets the request from the service to the MongoDB service at this IP address and the port that service has open. And then service will again select one of those pod replicas and forward that request to the selected pod at the port, the target port defined here. And this is the port where MongoDB application inside the pod is listening at. Now let's assume that inside that MongoDB pod, there is another container running that selects the monitoring metrics for Prometheus, for example. And that will be a MongoDB exporter. And that container, let's say, is running at port 9216. And this is where the application is accessible at. And in the cluster, we have a Prometheus application that scrapes the metrics endpoint from this MongoDB exporter container from this endpoint. Now that means that service has to handle two different endpoint requests, which also means that service has two of its own ports open for handling these two different requests. One from the clients that want to talk to the MongoDB database and one from the clients like Prometheus that want to talk to the MongoDB exporter application. And this is an example of a multi-port service. And note here that when you have multiple ports defined in a service, you have to name those ports. If it's just one port, then you can leave it, so to say, anonymous. You don't have to use the name attribute, it's optional. But if you have multiple ports defined, then you have to name each one of those. So these were examples of cluster IP service type. Now let's see another service type, which is called headless service. So let's see what headless service type is. As we saw, each request to the service is forwarded to one of the pod replicas that are registered as service endpoints. But imagine if a client wants to communicate with one of the pods directly and selectively. Or what if the endpoint pods need to communicate with each other directly without going through the service? Obviously, in this case, it wouldn't make sense to talk to the service endpoint, which will randomly select one of the pods because we want the communication with specific pods. Now, what would be such a use case? A use case where this is necessary is when we're deploying stateful applications in Kubernetes. Stateful applications like databases, MySQL, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, and so on. In such applications, the pod replicas aren't identical, but rather each one has its individual state and characteristic. For example, if we're deploying a MySQL application, you would have a master instance of MySQL and worker instances of MySQL application. And master is the only pod allowed to write to the database and the worker pods must connect to the master to synchronize their data after master pod has made changes to the database. So they get the up-to-date data as well. And when new worker pod starts, it must connect directly to the most recent worker node to clone the data from and also get up to date with the data state. So that's the most common use case where you need 
direct communication with individual pods. For such case, for a client to connect to all pods individually, it needs to figure out the IP address of each individual pod. One option to achieve this would be to make an API call to Kubernetes API server, and it will return the list of pods and their IP addresses. But this will make your application too tied to the Kubernetes specific API. And also this will be inefficient because you will have to get the whole list of pods and their IP addresses every time you want to connect to one of the pods. But as an alternative solution, Kubernetes allows clients to discover pod IP addresses through DNS lookups. And usually the way it works is that when a client performs a DNS lookup for a service, the DNS server returns a single IP address which belongs to the service. And this will be the service's cluster IP address, which we saw previously. However, if you tell Kubernetes that you don't need a cluster IP address of the service, by setting the cluster IP field to none when creating a service, then the DNS server will return the pod IP addresses instead of the services IP address. And now the client can do a simple DNS lookup to get the IP address of the pods that are members of that service. And then client can use that IP address to connect to the specific pod it wants to talk to or all of the pods. So the way we define a headless service in a service configuration file is basically setting the cluster IP to none. So when we create this service from this configuration file, Kubernetes will not assign the service a cluster IP address. And we can see that in the output when I list my services. So I have a cluster IP service that I created for the microservice and a headless service. And note here that when we deploy stateful applications in the cluster, like MongoDB, for example, we have the normal service, the cluster IP service that basically handles the communication to MongoDB and maybe other container inside the pod. And in addition to that service, we have a headless service. So we always have these two services alongside each other. So this can do the usual load balancing stuff, for this kind of use case and for use cases where a client needs to communicate with one of those pods directly, like a master node directly to perform the write commands or the pods to talk to each other for data synchronization, the headless service will be used for that. When we define a service configuration, we can specify a type of the service and the type attribute can have three different values. It could be cluster IP, which is a default. That's why we don't have to specify that. We have a node port and load balancer. So type node port basically creates a service that is accessible on a static port on each worker node in the cluster. Now to compare that to our previous example, the cluster IP service is only accessible within the cluster itself. So no external traffic can directly address the cluster IP service. The node port service, however, makes the external traffic accessible on static or fixed port on each worker node. So in this case, instead of ingress, the browser request will come directly to the worker node at the port that the service specification defines. And that port that node port service type exposes is defined in the node port attribute. And here note that the node port value has a predefined range between 30,000 and 32,767. So you can have one of the values from that range as a node port value. Anything outside that range won't be accepted. So this means that the node port service is accessible for the external traffic like browser requests, for example, at IP address of the worker node and the node port defined here. However, just like in cluster IP, we have a port of the service. So when we create the node port service, a cluster IP service to which the node port service will route is automatically created. And here, as you see, if I list the services, the node port will have the cluster IP address and for each IP address, it will also have the ports open where the service is accessible at. And also note that the service spans all the worker nodes. So 
if you have three pod replicas on three different nodes, basically the service will be able to handle that request coming on any of the worker nodes and then forward it to one of those pod replicas. Now that type of service exposure is not very efficient and also not secure because you're basically opening the ports to directly talk to the services on each worker node. So the external clients basically have access to the worker nodes directly. So if we gave all the services this node port service type, then we would have a bunch of ports open on the worker nodes the clients from outside can directly talk to. So it's not very efficient and secure way to handle that. And as a better alternative, there is a load balancer service type. And the way it works with load balancer service type is that the service becomes accessible externally through a cloud provider's load balancer functionality. So each cloud provider has its own native load balancer implementation, and that is created and used whenever we create a load balancer service type. Uh, Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Azure, Linode, OpenStack, and so on, all of them offer this functionality. So whenever we create a load balancer service, node port and cluster IP services are created automatically by Kubernetes to which the external load balancer of the cloud platform will route the traffic to. And this is an example of how did we define load balancer service configuration. So instead of node port type, we have a load balancer and the same way we have the port of the service, which belongs to the cluster IP, and we have the node port, which is the port that opens on the worker node, but it's not directly accessible externally, but only through the load balancer itself. So the entry point becomes a load balancer first, and it can then direct the traffic to node port on the worker node and the cluster IP, the internal service. So that's how the flow would work with the load balancer service. So in other words, the load balancer service type is an extension of the node port type, which itself is an extension of the cluster IP type. And again, if I create a load balancer service type and list all the services, you can see the differences in the display as well, where for each service type, you see the IP addresses, you see the type, and you see the ports that the service has opened. And I should mention here that in a real Kubernetes setup example, you would probably not use node port for external connection. You would maybe use it to test some service very quickly, but not for production use cases. So for example, if you have a application that is accessible through browser, you will either configure ingress for each such request. So you would have internal services, the cluster IP services that ingress will route to, or you would have a load balancer that uses the cloud platform's native load balancer implementation. Congratulations, you made it till the end. I hope you learned a lot and got some valuable knowledge from this course. If you want to learn about modern DevOps tools, be sure to check out my tutorials on that topic and subscribe to my channel for more content. Also, if you want to stay connected, you can follow me on social media or join the private Facebook group. I would love to see you there. So thank you for watching and see you in the next video.